This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a meeting this evening. It is 640 at, on uh, July 20th, and we are having trouble with Amherst Media. And so um, I regret for those of you that are trying to watch this through Amherst Media, if you know somebody that can um, that would like to watch it and you can give them the web address, uh, please do so. Uh, we are in the process now of, of meeting. Governor Baker has allowed us to do this. Um, we will go through the roll call and make sure that people can hear us and we can hear them. And then we will also um, let you know that if we have trouble with this connection, obviously we have trouble with the Amherst Media connection, we will, if we have to, pause the meeting and then come back on. So with that, let me start with the roll call. Please unmute. Let me know that you can hear me. And I can hear you. And we will continue. Shalini Ball Milm. Yes. Here. Lisa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. George. George Ryan. Sorry, Lynn. No problem with my machine. I'm here. No problem. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz is not here. Okay. Um, we're going to put up on our screen uh, the agenda so that you can see the announcements. And, uh, and actually, this is the agenda that basically is the order in which we're going to do things tonight. So um, I just want to point out that we are actually going to be discussing the COVID update and the election timeline, and then we will be going to the FY21 budget. Whether we get there by 8.30 or not is our hope, but we'll see. And then we will proceed on with the items and back to the town manager self-evaluation. Um, we are, um, I'd like to quickly Pause, if you will, for a moment and call upon Dorothy Pam. I just want to briefly say a few words about John Lewis and ask for a moment of silence. Um, in the 1960s, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, confronted racism in the most violent, segregated parts of the South, places that many other civil rights groups considered too dangerous to go. John Lewis is one of its strongest leaders, participated and led many of those events, facing racism and brutality with nonviolence and love. He understood that it was the hard daily and often unheralded voter registration and marches that would build a black movement that could revolutionize the South. In 1961, he was one of the original Freedom Riders. 1963, helped organize the March on Washington. And in 1964, coordinated the Mississippi Freedom Summer. He led the way and continued to lead throughout the rest of his life in the fight for justice and dignity for all. In his over 30 years in Congress, he never wavered or flinched from doing what had to be done. He'll be greatly missed. Now let us have a moment of silence to remember John Lewis.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are now, we do not have any hearings tonight. Um, and I want to just point out for those of you that have friends that are watching through Amherst Media, they can now see on the screen from Amherst Media how to connect to this meeting through their, um, on their phone and or through their uh, computer. So we are going to have general public comment at this point. This will not include comment on the budget. That will be later. This, will, this is comment on anything else except the budget. And so I would like to see hands of those people who would like to comment on items other than the budget at this time. Are there any people who would like to comment on items other than the budget at this time? Okay, I'm seeing no hands. And so we are going to go on to the consent agenda. And it's, the consent agenda is very brief this time. It only includes minutes of the council. And so the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I list it. The request to remove an item for the consent agenda does not require a second. So the motion is to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. The approval of minutes for June 17th, 2020, Joint Town Council and Governance Organization and Legislation Meeting Minutes. June 29th, 2020, Town Council Meeting Minutes. July 6th, 2020, Special Town Council Meeting Minutes. July 13th, 2020, Special Town Council Meet Meeting Library Update Minutes. Uh, July 13th, 2020, Joint Finance Committee Council FY21 budget hearing minutes. Is there anybody who would like anything removed? If not, I've already read the motion. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. Is there any other conversation about the minutes at this time? Did Kathy, she raised her hand. Yeah, Please. Kathy. Yeah, I, I just had um, on July 13th on the budget, I had one, what I think is a minor edit when it went through the issues that were raised um, by public comment on the budget on the police. And it was that there's a mix of services, including mental health and other issues. Um, is that, um, could I just send that later to Athena? Because it, it's not mentioned in the list, or at least I didn't see it. Let's accept that later into the minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any other comments? Seeing, seeing none, I'm going to move to a roll call vote. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Sorry, Thank I'm you. having to shift my position here. Aye. No problem. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz is absent. And uh, Shalini Balmill. Yes. The Consent agenda passes 12, 4, 0, 0, and 1 absent. Okay. I'm going to move into the discussion about COVID, and I'm going to call upon the town manager at this time, who is also got, has with him, Julie Fetterman. Thank you, Lynn. So this is, uh, we've been, we were doing these updates on a regular basis, and we've taken a break, but it's time to give you an, a new update. So um, next slide, please, Serge. 
so tonight we follow the same format. We'll give you a quick status report, quick town operations update, and then updates from Julie Fetterman, and then what we're looking at coming up for the fall, winter, uh, in the next few months. Next slide. So, um, so again, we are, this is the, the head, the, the uh, accounts for total cases. Again, 102 total cases in Amherst. We'll talk a little bit more, more about that since the beginning of the year, very low. We are one of the lowest uh, incidences in uh, the state of Massachusetts uh, outside of like uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Next slide. So I'm gonna give you a quick upper operations update. So the, uh, these are all the things that we check in on a regular basis. Our core team continues to meet regularly. We're down to about two or three times a week. Previously, we we're meeting seven days a week. But again, our core team, which includes the health director, the police, uh, police chief, the fire chief, emergency management director, the finance director, um, Sonia Aldridge, and uh, our superintendent of public works and the assistant town manager. And again, this is where we sort of sort through all the issues that are coming up uh, facing us with, with COVID. When we look at our um, first take on things, we talk about uh, force protection, which is are our staff um, healthy and safe and able to deliver services to the people? And across the board, we're in very good shape. Our, our police and fire emergency first responders are all in good shape. Um, the treatment plant operators for the water and wastewater all doing well. Um, there have been, um, we're, we're doing regular monitoring of all of our staff. Um, the, if there is anybody who's in, uh, who's been exposed, there is testing that's readily available to all of our staff. Um, and so I think that we're going, this, all systems go on this front. So I'll just move forward to the next one. Um, so again, trying to stay, have people stay in touch with the town. We have our COVID-19 website. We have a weekly call-in event on every Thursday at noon, and we've broadened the topics a little bit. Uh, this week, we'll have um, uh, we'll have we will have um, we're reaching out to members of the police department and health department see if they can join us, um, and to be talking about um, you know uh, code enforcement issues. And then Thursday, we have our um, or Friday, we have our um, Cup of Joe with Paul, and we'll, I'll be joined by our, the, the um, Chambers Director and the Business Improvement District direct, Director. That's Friday at 8 a.m. And those are times when people can call in through via Zoom. The links are on the website and you can participate in that conversation. Next slide. So we wanna give you some recent updates and um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And Julie, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, okay, so um, first of all, I wanted to make sure that people are familiar with what this is. The Mass Department of Public Health has a COVID-19 dashboard, which anyone can go to in the public town council. Um, I recommend it. A lot of people are starting to go there because they're really curious about statistics. So what you can see here is statistics by town. The, uh, the dashboard has it by county, you know, the, has hospitalizations, has all different types of data if you're really interested in data. So what we've got here is um, number of cases that there have been and the number of total tests over time. I'm gonna take you to column five which is total tests in the last 14 days. So we've had 482 tests and a total of positive cases in the last 14 days of four. Um, so I think this demonstrates that we still have um, not that many people getting tested um, and not that many people coming back positive. So there's a couple of things about that that are interesting. So first of all is the concept of, well, how readily available is testing out here? Um, and I'm happy to say that unlike other parts of the country, um, Massachusetts in general, and especially right out here in Amherst and in Hampshire County, there's a lot of testing available. So um, as always, it's best for people to go through their 
um, primary care provider if they have one to get a test because you can talk through with your primary care provider. Um, you're going to either go through very likely Cooley Dickinson Hospital or Bay State depending on where your provider is affiliated. Um, for folks who don't want to do that or don't have a health care provider, CVS is doing testing, CVS in Northampton and also CVS in Amherst. You can go online to sign up for that. They'll ask you a series of questions. Um, the CVS in Amherst is open 9 to 1 and 2 to 5.30 for um, drive-up testing. Um, Again, I do encourage people to go through a primary care provider. If someone doesn't have a primary care provider, this is a great time to be getting one. Um, so testing is, is readily available in this area. So the other thing that I'm sure everyone has heard about is that, um, of course, many people are asymptomatic, um, so they're not getting tested. Um, one of the things that we're seeing emerging around the country is a, a demographic that is starting to um, test positive and either become sick or have rates of being asymptomatic are those between the ages of 18 and 30. Um, so we are concerned across the country about our young people. Um, we know that Many young people will be coming back to Amherst soon to attend college or university. Um, I think this is something that we're looking at sort of across the board in Massachusetts. Um, so I'll get back to that a little bit more and talk about that a little more. I also want to say that when you are looking at data, I'll sometimes have residents emailing me saying, well, what does the data mean? I think it's also really important to not just depend on this data because again, there are a lot of people who aren't getting tested. And so you can't necessarily rely on COVID-19 data to completely tell you what the incidence of disease is in, in your community, including in Amherst. I think that it's still important for everyone to remain vigilant. That's how um, we really have kept things, how we beat things back um, uh, in, in Massachusetts. We decreased cases, we decreased hospitalizations, we decreased deaths. Um, and then you saw us opening up and going through the phases. So um, while this is all really good news and really good news for our economy and folks to be able to be able to get out and about. It doesn't mean that we should change any of our habits. It's still really important to have six foot social dis physical distancing between others. And when you can't, especially inside, to be wearing a mask. Uh, the other thing we've sort of, not sort of, the other thing we have been finding out about transmission of this disease is that more and more during this good weather around the country, we're seeing that transmission is really not happening outside. You probably all have read in the news how much concern there was about how many people would be testing positive after these large, large group protests around the country, including um, in Massachusetts, especially in the eastern part of the state where there were a lot of people. Massachusetts and many other states offered free testing. And what has come forward is uh, no spike in an increase in positive cases. And so that's giving us an incredible amount of data about how this disease is transmitted. So um, again, it comes down to social distancing um, and using a mask if you're going to be stationary, waiting in line. I love to say when you're waiting in line to get into Antonio's, six feet apart, you know, wear your mask when you go inside. Um, and of, of course, continue to wash your hands um, and to use common sense. If you're not feeling well yourself, you need to stay home and check in with a healthcare provider. Um, so I have a number of things I wanted to bring up. So um, another thing is that people have bringing, been bringing up the concept of, do we need to have a mask order in town? Um, what we're doing in the town at this time 
is putting up signs throughout the downtown. Those are um, being fabricated and putting up, being put up in the next week. Um, they're blue and white signs that will be uh, asking people to keep socially distant and to wear masks. The bid also has complimentary signs that are up on the doors of businesses asking people to use masks when they're going inside. Um, we'll also be putting, we've ordered 40 signs and there will also be signs going up at some of our fields um, so that people understand and remember that when you're outside, if you are gonna be stationary in a group and you're doing something or you're watching something that you still need to be either using social distancing or wearing a mask. Um, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with the schools. Um, I'm really excited about how much work the superintendent, the school nurse manager, the school committee, and all the staff, et cetera, have put into creating plans for how to keep our students healthy when school does open. Um, I think we are um, incredibly lucky with the team we have there and the, the close communication that they have um, with uh, myself and our public health nurse, Jennifer Brown. Um, and so that leads me to the, the uh, final topic I wanted to talk about, which is our university and our colleges. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a demographic in, in this country um, many of whom will be returning to go to college, many of whom will be returning from vacations in other parts of the country and coming back to Amherst to work or to be living in their families' homes. Um, some will be off campus for school, some will be on campuses. Uh, and so uh, the health department, myself and Jennifer Brown have been working closely with the university and the colleges to talk about how, how testing of students and contact tracing will happen. Um, in fact, tomorrow we have a five college meeting that will be uh, the three health directors from the three towns, the public health nurses, um, and medical and public health staff from all five entities uh, of higher education, where we'll be talking about uh, issues around contact tracing and interfacing with town health department and public health staff. In Amherst, we're very lucky because we've had a unique relationship for two decades with UMass. Uh, myself and the primary public health nurse there at UMass, Ann Becker, um, worked closely with the state when the state was rolling out their electronic disease surveillance system, which I've, I've mentioned before, it's called MAVEN. Um, and we really created a, uh, a, a unique system because MAVEN was created for all the 351 local boards of health to find out electronically when there was a one of 60 communicable diseases in their town. But what we realized was that the university um, I love to call my large village in this town, and that we work so closely together. Um, so we petitioned the state that it would be great if both of us, public health professionals, could see the cases in the university and in the town. And so we've been doing that, as I say, for two decades uh, and sharing in com confidential HIPAA protected public health information back and forth between us um, because there is often, of course, overlap between students and those who work in the community or live off campus or perhaps are um, interning in our schools. So we have a long history of doing this um, and uh, we're just building on that with uh, how we will be responding to and the university will be responding to COVID-19 cases, contact tracing, and the need for isolation and quarantine. Um, the university has, uh, health services has had long, a long history of working with Amherst College and Hampshire College also. Um, Amherst College now has their own standalone um, public health response for communicable disease, and we work very closely with Amherst College also. Hampshire is still closely linked with the university. So we're all communicating and um, 
we're working on how to improve that um, over the next six weeks, five weeks, um, as students come back into town and we anticipate um, a lot of testing going on and uh, positive cases that we'll need to have very quick and efficient contact, contact tracing. So I've said a lot, and I'm thinking maybe I should take a pause here. So let's finish our, the rest of our presentation then while you take a pause. Okay. If you can go to the next slide, search. search. So I wanted to note that we are in phase three, step one of the governor's plan for reopening. And, um, you know, and that's sort of where everybody knows where we're there, where we are on that. So next slide. So I want to update you on um, sort of where we are in terms of phase three, step one, um, that our local facilities, the swimming pools are open, the Puffer's Pond is open, Farmer's Market is open. Um, so each one of those things says, oh, that's good, but there's an enormous amount of staff work that went into making sure that every one of those facilities and um, operations were open with support from the town, uh, extensive new staffing models, um, and people pitching in from LSSE to the inspection services to Julie to everybody weighing in on these things. So that was, that's was that been a big, uh, big effort. Local economies, you saw the zoning change uh, that you approved. Um, the Resilient Amherst Initiative, which has been working with the bid in the chamber. Um, we have secured a Solomon uh, Foundation grant for $10,000. We have a grant in into the Department of Transportation for a much larger amount of money to continue with the work that the Solomon Foundation grant started. Um, we have allocated CBG funds for um, business, uh, for small businesses. Um, we approved the public way use. We have rent stabilization funds through the housing trust fund, um, outdoor dining, and, and so a lot of things happening on the local economy level. And then at the town government, as I mentioned earlier, that um, you know, we are continuing to maintain all of our services. We've expanded our online options, including with the inspection services and the town clerk's office in particular. And then we continue to support uh, the Zoom meetings as you, as you see them tonight. So next slide. So we want, we want to talk about a little bit about what's coming up in the, in the fall and the winter. So next slide. So as Julie mentioned, the K to, K to 12 schools, I mean, that is an enormous challenge for the uh, district and th they have gone about it very deliberately looking at going down every path to determine what is the best, safest route to educate our children in the fall. And you know, there have been, they're meeting tonight to talk about different options available to them again. So again, kudos to the superintendent and his team. Uh, trying to engage with the unions and listening to parents and their concerns and guardians and their concerns. Um, so we're going to talk about colleges and university. We and we um, will see an increase, you know, just normally in the fall, we see an increase in uh, student populations on campus and off campus. And we have definite public safety and public health concerns, which were articulated in a letter that I wrote to the chancellor um, about eight days ago. Um, and for the town government section, uh, we want to continue to expand our online options. We have serious concerns about elections, which is why the town clerk is here tonight to talk to you about some options available to you in that uh, in that vein. And then we are looking at, you know, should we or are we in a position to start holding in-person meetings? Um, and that's a, not another discussion down the road. So next slide. So I just want to update you on where um, I understand the colleges and universities to be as of today. So Amherst College, uh, uh, they're all, all three institutions are opening around the third week of August uh, and closing right before Thanksgiving. They have slightly different schedules for the spring, uh, opening up in February or mid-January. For Amherst College, they anticipate about 12 to 1,250 students on campus. That's about 60% occupancy. Uh, Hampshire expects to be about 50% occupancy. And uh, I think in UMass is still uh, trying to determine how many students are returning. The, uh, and I think July 30th is a deadline for students who are first year students coming into the campus, how many are going to be on campus. Um, Amherst College has a statement of shared responsibility, which every student will 
will require be signed, have to be signed. Hampshire College actually has a, a statement like that as well, but they have not uh, re released that yet. Uh, and UMass has their UMass agreement. Um, it's in UMA, for Amherst College. If you when you come on campus, you're required to stay on campus, um, and very little interaction. Hampshire College, you're required to come to quarantine for two weeks on campus, and then you're supposed to limit your travel on and off campus. And UMass, again, they want you to stay on campus if, as much as possible. So, in terms of the uh, health monitoring, uh, you know, I think Julie mentioned what what Amherst College is doing. Uh, Hampshire is relying on, um, but but uh, Amherst College has INQ shelters for all their students available to them. They've made arrangements on campus and elsewhere. Uh, Hampshire feels that they've got INQ. INQ is isolation and quarantine. Um, uh, they have that availability on campus. They've reserved some dorms for that purpose. Um, and UMass will be health monitoring and they have uh, isolation quarantine shelters for those students living on campus. Um, when, we, when we asked the three institutions how many were li living off campus, you know, Amherst College said less than 50. Um, you know, Hampshire College is, again, less than 50. I think they're in like the 20 to 30 student range. And we're trying to get a grasp on how many are off campus um, with the university. And a good thing that the university is doing this year is when you sign up under their electronic system, they're asking for a local address where you will be staying this, this um, fall semester which would facilitate contact tracing for them. So next slide. So we have many concerns coming forward and we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, just a large number of students returning to town, you know, I think someone said it's like having a cruise ship dock um, in the center of town and, with, and, and that's not far from the truth. So we are, have a, as Julie mentioned, we have a very low incidence of uh, COVID-19 infection, um, but we will have a lot of people returning to town and it's, it's not just students, it's also people who are, who've been elsewhere during the summer and things like that. We are a mobile population. So um, we are thinking about that and trying to prepare for that. Um, we worry about um, if there is an outbreak, our, our, our biggest concern is in the public health of our, of our community. We, we, our concern is that uh, there will be spread of the disease, that if the disease spreads at a um, very large rate, we worry about the capacity of our local medical facilities to handle that kind of surge. Um, we worry about any kind of spread, community-wide spread on our K-12 school system. Um, and, um, and then I think we'll, we will notice most likely, um, and we're already starting to see it, that many of our year-round residents are seeing um, smallish parties and by Amherst standards, um, but people are starting to call and say, there's a party on this at this private house and they're not social distancing, they're not wearing masks. And normally that person might have just walked by or driven by that household as being a normal student party. But in this day and age, it's a different feeling for people because people are noticing student behavior specifically. And so that's gonna create additional um, drain on resources for the town and responses because we respond to every call. Um, and we worry about possible friction if police are, are asked to respond to each of these situations. It's things that they normally might not res respond to. So these are the, the kinds of concerns that prompted me to write the letter um, on July 10th to the chancellor. Now, this afternoon, you all received a response from the chancellor and they had a press conference. So it was the first that, and I've been in meetings all afternoon, so I really haven't read it super carefully. Um, so, uh, but um, uh, we, ha we do have a meeting scheduled with the chancellor tomorrow. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to sort of digging more into what he's saying in his letter. Um, I think the devil is in the details. I think it's a really, it's a, it's a good uh, response. I think they, they have heard our concerns and they've addressed some of them, but I think we have additional concerns that we wanna make sure that, to emphasize with the chancellor and his staff. Um, so, um, and what are those concerns? The, the biggest one is that um, we believe that they should be treating all of their students the same. 
whether they're on campus or off campus. Uh, there's really not going to be a difference in real life between students who live on campus and students live a few hundred yards away off campus. So we want them to provide the same kind of health um, protections and um, support to the students who live off campus to the students that live that are living on campus. I, I think it's a false division that they're making and I don't think it's a good one. Um, and I, I think that um, the, the fact of the matter, and we all know this, is that students are going to socialize. That's part of what young people do, and that's a great thing about young people, but um, but it's a thing that we have to recognize. Um, we want them to make sure that every student uh, who is enrolled signs the UMass agreement. It's a it's an important tool that the university has that because that UMass agreement is tied to their code of conduct. We also would like them to uh, vigorously enforce the UMass agreement because we don't think that that kind of enforcement has to needs to fall to the town. Uh, that's exactly the type of situation we don't want to put our police or health inspectors in. It's something that we were happy to work with the university on, but we think it is a responsibility of the university uh, to take this on. I think if you saw the letter that Tulane University sent to their students, it was unambiguous and clear. And right now I feel like the, a lot of the messaging from the university isn't as crystal clear as we would like it to be. Um, we, I believe that they should provide isolation and quarantine shelters on campus for any student. It's unrealistic for students to believe that, for the university to believe that if you live, if you're four students living in a two bedroom apartment and one of you gets COVID positive that you can re legitimately go back to your apartment and isolate or quarantine successfully. It's unrealistic. We need to provide support for these students so that they are they maintain they're able to maintain their health and prevent the spread. Um, the other thing, another thing we want to talk to the university about is the metrics. And this is really complex science, and so um, they have many more experts than we do in terms of what are the what should we expect in terms of number of infections coming into the town based on the number of students that they're anticipating coming in and where they're coming from? Because there will be an increase. We should be all be recognizing that because anytime you introduce a large population into another population, there will be this increase. That's not, we're not saying there shouldn't be, but there, we want to project out what is expected and what's beyond what we expect. Um, and so basically our message to the university is that we want to continue to work together. Julie identified a lot of really positive ways that we have worked over years with the university, which has been a really terrific working relationship. We want to build on that. These are different times. We can't rely on our old standards of, um, of, of you know, responding to house parties. It's going to be a different way to doing, doing things. So I know a lot of the counselors have ideas and thoughts. And so Julie are, and I are here to answer any of your questions. And I think you can take the slide down. Sure, search. Okay, so um, the town manager did mention that we have an upcoming meeting tomorrow with the chancellor, and you all did receive both the letter that the town manager sent uh, a week and a half ago, and you've received the response from the university. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I, I think that the most important thing is that UMass must provide the isolation and quarantine for the students, which uh, the town manager was stressing. Um, I, I just also think that we need to be very, very careful that things match up. For example, I don't think I remembered any statement about students quarantining as they're coming in from all over the U.S., which has got some many hot spots in the world. Um, was there any give on that question that UMass would require some quarantining at once they got here before they joined, did anything else? Mr. Bach. Uh, yeah, I, I know Hampshire and Amherst are, I don't recall whether UMass is, maybe Julie knows the answer to that. Correct, Hampshire and um, Amherst College all are, are doing that. I have not seen that explicitly in UMass's plan. I think UMass did say they would test everyone upon arrival or prior to arrival into the town. So everybody will be tested. 
whether they're on campus or off. Correct. Steve Schreiber. So the chancellor literally maybe an hour ago sent, um, or the, I'm not the chancellor, but the UMass literally an hour ago sent a, a email, and I don't know who got it, about this issue of coming in from out of state or out of country and what the quarantine rules currently are and what the expectations are for that. I don't know if prospective students got that or current, it was addressed to students, faculty, staff. But that would, that's an excellent point and, and I hope you talk about it tomorrow. So I also read quickly the chancellor's statement and you know, first of all, thank you to Paul and all for the letter to the chancellor, which then led to the clarification of what the expectations are. But I think the, so they talk about sort of the, if students living in Amherst or students living in the Amherst area. So to me, that could be much more specific, like students living within blank miles of the UMass campus, ten, choose a number, because Amherst area or Amherst, that can mean so many different things. And I know that we're particularly concerned about our town, but I think that should be much more specific, that if you live within a certain range, you, you will, the assumption is that you will have interaction with the main campus. That's it. But thank you, thank you all. Uh, George Ryan. Thank you, Lynn. Some of the suggestions I've heard from people in my district um, involve uh, ideas like mandating a, a mask zone. In other words, uh, uh, sort of requiring certain things uh, that have to be done. My sense listening to Julie and, and, and listen to Paul is that we still are kind of following a, a process of more education and um, persuasion. Um, there seems to be, and perhaps rightly so, a reluctance to sort of have edicts from, uh, from the health department, but rather using signage and so forth. Is that fair to say right now that the, the emphasis is on that? And so the idea of uh, establishing like an, you know, a zone where everyone has to wear a mask and it's by edict um, is really not under consideration at the moment. Another suggestion was using a police officer, at least in the first couple of weeks, uh, just patrolling the downtown. Um, just to be a presence, not to you know hassle people, but just to remind them the officer could even carry extra masks. I think the bid is going to have them anyway available to people. Um, uh, obviously, manpower is a really uh, rare, it's something precious, um, but that was another suggestion. So just some thoughts on sort of our overall approach. Is it more um, you know mandates, edicts, and then enforcement, or is it more encouragement, um, education, and persuasion? Thank you for the question, George. Um, I think it's a really good one because we are constantly reevaluating that. Um, we have talked um, about the concept of should there be a mask zone, for instance, in downtown. Um, and so that may be a decision that we make. What we thought we would do is start with the signage. As I say, there's signage on all the buildings. There'll be signage hanging downtown. Again, you know, as every week goes by, the science is showing us that it's really not about walking by people. Um, it is about being in stationary groups. And so again, if we're look, seeing that, oh, that's happening in downtown, then we could, we could create a mask zone. I think we, ha we have definitely also talked about, should we just have the whole town be, you gotta wear a mask. Um, and we always come back to, no, we don't need to do that because this is a very rural area. There are so many parts of town where you can be out walking about, you can have your mask with you and you can um, just put it on if you happen to be stopping to wanna have a conversation with someone. Um, and so I, I think that you put it well, that we're still at that point where we wanna educate, we wanna have people comply, but then we'll, we'll evaluate. And if we need to do something otherwise, we will. Because there's always that tension between when you make, as you say, an edict or a regulation or a bylaw, you've gotta enforce it and you have to enforce it evenly. And what we're looking at is that each thing that we attempt to do, whether it's just open Puffer's Pond or have the pools open, it's, it's taking a lot of people power and a lot of thought to put the plan into place. So certainly at that moment where we see that 
this isn't working well, then that's absolutely one of the tools in the toolbox um, to have a mask order. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, the concept of maybe having a police officer walking around town, um, I think we have talked about the concept of maybe some type of staff person that could walk through town or an ambassador or working with the university on, again, if we're looking at that there's gonna be a lot of young people in our downtown, is this one of the places where the university could help us? Do they have staff? Do they have um, student ambassadors who could help with that? Um, so I think those are definitely two active ideas. I, I think. I think the university has been pretty unambiguous and a lot of the colleges are saying this, that when you leave your dorm room, you put on a mask. You don't take it off until you return to your dorm room. And like, we are not saying that for our town. And, you know, I think Julie has a more nuanced view of it. And I think one of the reasons is being a rural town, but also being in a lot in com a, a allied with where the um, state is. Because once individual communities start putting up you know, different, having different standards. I, I cross the line into Hadley. I don't need to wear a mask. It just gets confusing to the general public because people don't know where the town lines are. So I think, again, we're monitoring this and welcome feedback along the ways. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, UMass Health Center, are they going to be able to uh, administer tests? So the testing, testing capacity as students come back and UMass does have a health center and there are people who work there. So that's one question. And then, um, you know, I, I put, I had sent an email to Paul about a resident who had an experience inside a small store where it wasn't posted you had to wear a mask people in line weren't wearing a mask and at least some of the service people. So I'm wondering if we have, and um, so I, I emailed her back, but do we have some place where people can clearly see what those rules are? Like ABC, you know, if you go inside, you're supposed to wear a mask. And I saw the state has a poster and the employer can put up on the workers' rights, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. But I think if people knew there is a free sign. So our little Atkins that's now closed had a very clear sign. You can't enter without a mask. You know, it was just there on the door. Um, that's the policy. But trying to make sure people know they don't have to go out and print these signs. We can give you these signs and that inspectors. So somehow we don't have, I don't mind handling individuals this way, but people should know what they could do to get action on stuff. Because you have a lot of people willing to take that next step. I can tell you where to get a sign. I can tell you who to call. So those were my two questions. And I guess Paul has already mentioned his, his letter was stronger. I mean, it's a good first step, the chancellor's letter, but his code of conduct suggestion is that potential suspension applies on campus and off campus, as does isolation. Um, you know, so it was pretty clear that there's not a double standard on whether you're within the university or outside. But we didn't quite get that back in that letter. So I'm not asking a question about that. I'm asking the first two. Yeah. Okay. So, Kathy, um, so tomorrow when we have, uh, so there are two meetings happening tomorrow. There's one that's with upper management at UMass. And then I've got one, as I say, with the folks who are um, getting the contact tracing up and running. And so um, I will be confirming tomorrow, I believe, whether it'll be just UHS doing testing or if UMass did sign a contract with the Broad Institute, who's helping many of our um, institutions of higher education with their testing. So one way or the other, I will say that um, UMass is definitely going to be on top of having enough testing. Um, currently, they're able to be doing testing, you know, for example, the football team is on campus, they're being tested. Um, so I'll be confirming that tomorrow. The last I had spoke with public health folks at UMass about 10 days ago, um, that was still being confirmed how they were moving forward with that. 
Um, your other question about small businesses. So I think there's a couple things there and, you know, Paul can jump in too. Um, I believe the bid is working really actively with businesses to give them signs. Um, there are also free signs from the state. You are correct. Um, in terms of people going into a business and having a problem, um, many of those um, uh, complaints have come to various ones of us, of us, whether it's the council or health inspectors or myself or the town manager's office. Uh, we are going to be meeting, I believe it's later this week, with inspection services and Rob Mora, the building commissioner, which is where all the inspectors sit now, even the health inspectors, and talking about um, how we want to um, do we need to sort of streamline how complaints go and perhaps then be able to advertise how folks can do that. Um, but we certainly, um, all of us are getting um, various, you know, concerns about, well, I shouldn't say that there's so many, but you know, when there's a concern about a business, it goes through inspection services and then an inspector follows up um, and does um, an onsite inspection, a phone call, a variety of things to see what kind of assistance that business needs because we know that it's also and, and really we've seen this more in other parts of the country but um that there can be problems with getting people to comply with how they should be behaving inside a business so i hope that's helpful shalini yeah i was wondering if we can reach out to um landlords because i was speaking to one landlord and they mentioned that when they heard a complaint from the neighbor they actually actively reached out to the students and uh, were very clear about you know the, what the policies are and that they would be asked to vacate if they did not follow through and i'm wondering if but i don't think all landlords are as conscientious i'm wondering if it would make sense to actively reach out to landlords and have a clear policy uh, with them. And the second thing I was wondering is if you could hear from maybe uh, the bid and, and or the chamber about what they're hearing, uh, what are the problems that businesses are encountering and, and, and what are the fears that consumers have? I mean, we're all hearing that as a town council, but also I see that there are some members of the bid and chamber here on the call if we feel like we want to hear from them what is the perspective of businesses and consumers? Yeah, so there is a meeting. Um, we have a regular meeting around this time of year with the large landlords, not all the, it's mostly the ones that run the big, uh, have the, mm -hmm. the largest landlords. And that happens every year around this time. But this year will be different because we'll be talking about COVID-19 and, and what mm -hmm. the expectations are and yeah. what they're hearing and things like that. Um, so I think that, that um, you know, I think that that's, so we will be engaging with that conversation. Um, and, you know, I think that the bid in the chamber have been very good about reaching out to all their individual businesses and saying, do you need mm -hmm. signs? We've got them for you if you want them. I mean, it's almost like, um, let's just think about this as we we're talking, like we should have signs say, you know, no shoes, no shirt, no mask, no service, you know, almost mm -hmm. type thing, you know. Right. That's and fine. And to, to bring some humor to it, but also be very clear about well, it. Well, people are used to seeing that sign and nobody objects to that. They don't go and saying, yeah. I don't, I want to come in and I have a right, right to not wear my shirt. Um, so. Right. Alyssa. I didn't think it would be my turn yet. I'll try and talk fast. Um, when it comes to the things we've been talking about so far, I'm really glad other people brought up my same concerns. I do want to go on the record as saying, oh, I hate when people say that. I do want to be known as saying that I, while I do understand the need to enforce, right, you don't set up a rule that you can't actually enforce. And I most definitely do not want officers with sidearms doing the enforcement. I don't find that appropriate. But at the same time, I disagree with our path on let's be lenient now and see if we need help later. I would much rather we were strict now before the students come back on August 24th. We can always relax our standards later. Trying to convince them in September or October that it's not quite time to close the university, but we need some stricter controls downtown is just not the right path. I understand it, but I disagree with it. I also do want to make sure I appreciate that you have worked and inspections has worked with um, 
members of the community who've contacted you because I've referred them to you and they said, I was in a store and the management said, we don't really feel like we can throw the customer out. And I said, well, go see if maybe they'll feel like they can give them the strength to throw the customer out. So I appreciate that. If we're gonna talk about UMass at the same time, I'm assuming if that's all right, Lynn. Um, okay, so that I don't talk more than once. Um, UMass reopening. As you all know, I have a disclosure on file that shows that while I work part-time on the campus, I'm not employed by UMass. My husband is employed by UMass. And I just wanna make clear that while we're playing super nice here about our relationship with UMass, which has been really important to me because I've been an at-large elected official since 2002, we've worked so hard to make a really effective relationship through all different kinds of changes at both the university and the town. And at the same time, I am just, despite how overwhelmed we are, I'm disappointed. UMass is not being our partner here. 10 days for a response, no acknowledgement, no, we're writing a really big thing, we're gonna have a press release, you know, please be patient with us while we get the rest of the details together, nothing. And then we finally get something 10 days later. Yes, I appreciate that they've been meeting with us. Yes, I appreciate that they took some of the edits that the town manager offered, but it is not realistic to expect the students that are coming from those 42 states who are gonna be living off campus to actually volunteer to quarantine themselves for 14 days. So I look forward to that guidance Steve said he saw that shows how they're actually gonna enforce that because I'll be fascinated to see that. But in the meantime, the, state, the statement, as, as Paul's already mentioned, that students engaged in remote learning who choose not to return to campus or the surrounding area are encouraged to sign the agreement as well is in a word, garbage. We already have students who are treating their prepaid rentals, I mean, they're paying for their lease. They were either here all along or they're getting ready to come back as party shacks. There are people being invited from all over to attend parties there. And if they live in, let's not pick on a community, but Chicopee, if they live in Chicopee, they take their classes online. The way this is currently set up, despite our talking to each other, is to say that ah, Chicopee's not a surrounding community, probably. Therefore, it's totally fine that kids from Chicopee come up, party, do whatever they want, because they're not subject to the same code of conduct. And when we talk about the code of conduct, that's like really all well and good. But when the code of conduct talks about persistent and egregious violations, we don't want to send our cops out to be the ones to enforce that. UMass has volunteered nothing in terms of enforcing it themselves off campus. This is not the partnership that we need. I understand our community's frustration. I'm really disappointed in where we are so far, and I hope that that's made clear tomorrow at this meeting, that they are, in fact, during a public health emergency, responsible for their off-campus student behavior. This is totally different than any normal year where it's just like, hey, you're a taxpayer, you're a renter, you're just a regular resident like everybody else. This is not the same. And so I really hope that that's emphasized with them tomorrow. Thank you. Pat. Yeah, I'm gonna be redundant and um, a little redundant. I'm very glad that there was some thought given to not using armed police officers to patrol the streets um, to ask people to wear masks. Uh, the very fact that you thought that, that maybe we should have a police officer, deeply upsets me because it is exactly the kind of inappropriate use of police officers that has gotten us uh, in the trouble that we are in as a town uh, and as a community. And, a, you know, and I'm... <laughs> mm -hmm. It is inappropriate it's wrong and it can, those kinds of decisions need to stop being made and they need to be stop being made now uh, mandy joe yeah so um i'll try to cover things quickly ditto Alyssa and ditto pat um but a couple of things um i delved into the umass agreement last night which i hope get some serious changes to it. Um, and then I read the letter today, which seems to somewhat contradict the UMass agreement and the FAQs. Um, I am concerned when they say that their testing strategy will mitigate community spread through early identification, yet we know 
that many people are asymptomatic carriers. And they have no information on their website and have never mentioned anywhere of an employee testing strategy. So we have no idea whether they're actually going to test any employees that are on campus, especially employees that are not showing symptoms. We do not know, we now know based on the letter today that they intend to test students once a week, uh, whether or not, once a week only if students live on campus, have a dining pass, or have a class on campus. That does not include all students. And we know students are some of the main asymptomatic carriers, yet they'll only be tested once a week, uh, according to what they said. And there is a study out there by Yale University that modeled potential infection rates in congregate housing at universities with an assumption that 5,000 students are on campus and only 10 of them come in positive. And if you test weekly, in a base case scenario, meaning five outside infections each week to those 5,000 students that live on campus and an R value of two, two and a half, even with a 90% accurate positive testing test, at weekly testing, 1,600 of those 5,000 students under this model will become infected over the course of 80 days. Assuming that UMass is going to put 10,000 students on their campus, that's 3,200 positive tests of the on-campus students alone. If you go to a larger outside influence of infections, you have every, student, every single one of those 5,000 infected if you only test weekly. So I am deeply concerned about only testing weekly and only testing those that actually have interactions on campus. Um, I am deeply concerned about the fact that their literature says that they encourage those who are on campus that test positive and those who are off campus that test positive to isolate themselves at their home, wherever their parents may be, if they can have private transportation there. This is not the position of a partner to the state keeping infection levels down or our town keeping infection levels down. Basically what they're saying with those statements is if you're infected here, go to your home in Andover or um, you know, Agawam or Boston and go isolate there and infect that community. That is not a partner in this state. They need to take, a, take responsibility for the entire population on their campus to isolate anyone who tests positive so that those tests that test positive do not spread the disease. With that in mind, um, I'm wondering the state itself set up testing sites in those areas of the state, mostly in Eastern Massachusetts, for free testing of any resident at any time with, I don't know how many their hours were, um, recently um, in those areas that were having higher positive test rates. When can we get a test like a site like that in Amherst, given the fact that we're looking at potentially on models thousands of positive tests in Amherst alone when students come back. Um, and that's assuming decent amount of uh, compliance by students and faculty and staff and residents in town with masking and social distancing. So those are my concerns. Um, nothing about staff and anyone else on campus. Um, I know we don't have answers, but that's what I want brought up tomorrow. I don't think they're a partner with not only us, but the entire state keeping this under control. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and since I decided, I figured out I can raise my own hand. Um, so I've been taking copious notes and um, agree with every statement I've heard so far, uh, particularly the act now instead of wait till later. Um, and I want to just carry forward a conversation that I had with Julie a little earlier today. And that is, what is the role of the Board of Health? And what can we ask them to do at this point? And is that something you need the council to talk to you about? Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, no, as I mentioned earlier, I'm happy to bring this all back to the Board of Health. They are, of course, 
very closely monitoring what's happening in our town around coronavirus. Um, they too are concerned about what it will be like when we have many, many students come back to town. Um, so I can cer certainly bring this back to the Board of Health. Um, the, the chair and I had had a conversation about 10 days ago about the concept of perhaps having um, a zone in town that was um, that required masks. So um, this can certainly be brought back to the board to discuss with them. Um, I appreciate that. I also want to correct one misperception. The university may open on the 24th, but they start bringing students back into the dorms on the 15th. This is less than one month away. We have passed the point where we can wait and pause anymore to get what we need. With that, I'm going to go to Evan only because Shalini and Kathy have already spoken and I want to try to use our rules. So Evan. So I just wanted to, to raise two things, um, neither of which are a question, so sorry. Um, so, so one is regarding um, a mandatory mask order for the downtown. Um, this is something that if you had talked to me perhaps two weeks ago, I probably would have said, eh, I don't really think that we need one. Um, many of you know, I, I just spent a little bit of time in a lovely gay Cape community, uh, which has a mandatory mask order on their main commercial strip. Um, I wore my mask every time I stepped out onto the street, which I do not do in this community, I'll admit. Um, and it made me feel actually a little bit better. Uh, they had ambassadors who were uh, very plain clothed volunteers who were going around who had masks on hand to hand out, um, who were making sure it was enforced, certainly not police officers. In fact, I don't know that I saw a police officer my entire week there. Um, but I think part of it is, is um, public health, and I appreciated Julie's response, but I think the other part of it is people's confidence in coming into town. I think that there are people who will come into town, um, especially vulnerable people, who if they see people not wearing masks are gonna say, I'm not gonna make that shopping trip to Xana, or I'm not gonna go out to eat, or I'm not gonna grab that takeout, um, but will have confidence knowing there's a mandatory mask order that they can actually go into town. I think there's an entire group of people that if we don't have this, we'll ignore our downtown completely. And so I understand that there's some uncertainty in the public health side. I don't think it's just a public health decision. I think it's also about the message we're saying, sending to people who want to come into our town, um, that we're taking this seriously, that we're all going to do our part, that we're not going to leave it up to the individual to decide whether or not they want to wear a mask. Because I'll, I'll be honest, when, I'm, when I don't have to wear a mask, it's hot. I probably won't but I wore one every day on Commercial Street because I had to. They had a 24 hour mandatory mask order. Um, so I, I hope when we're thinking about this going forward, we'll consider that it's not just about um, the public health evidence, it's also about the confidence of our population when they come into town. Um, regarding some of the UMass stuff, I'll keep most of, uh, I, I feel I have fewer concerns than the members of this council about UMass's reopening plan. And I, I really appreciated the chancellor's letter um, today, which I think clarified a lot of concerns that I did have. But I do just want to point out, and I, and I know everyone knows what I'm going to say here, that I, I hope in all of these conversations, we all start from the place that students are a valued part of, valued part of this community. Um, a lot of the emails we have received have painted students returning as if it's the apocalypse returning. And I think our message needs to be we have some concerns, but we're happy you're coming back because you are members of our community. You add vibrancy to our town. You support our economy. We want you here. We just want to do it safely. And I worry that some of the tone that I've seen in some of the discourse, not necessarily in this council, but on occasion, um, has not uh, conveyed that message, has been 
students are scary. We're scared of these people coming back to our community. It's going to be a disaster. And I hope that we always center the conversation around, we want you here. We want you to be part of our community. We see you as part of our community. You pay money here to, to rent here. You have every right to be here as every other member of this community, as every homeowner, as every member of this council. But we want to make sure that you're doing it safely. And I hope that what it doesn't result in, and I have real concerns about, is students being over-policed. Uh, I know there's, there's two houses uh, nearby me that students are often in the front yard um, drinking, and it appears to be a big party. But it's a house that has a num two houses next to each other. They both have a number of students that have been living together. I don't care if those two houses get together and drink in their front lawn, and I don't want the cops being called on them because of that. And so I hope that we're... Uh, we think about our language. I hope that we make sure that we make clear that students are welcome here, that we're not trying to police them, that we're not trying to villainize them, but that we're doing our best to make sure our community is safe during these times. Thank you. Um, Shalini, you have your hand up again. Yeah, I was just, um, just a spin off of what Evan was saying. I really appreciate what he said. And I wonder if we could have a campaign that's um, really when the students are coming back, like a welcoming campaign with signage or whatever and encouraging them in a playful, fun, direct way to remember to wear the masks. And on another side note, we were out hiking along self Pond and we went to Jake's and I was really happy to see that the young students were actually wearing the masks that came to Jake's and it's a surprising, maybe not surprising, that there were many older people actually who were not carrying masks for them. So that's, you know, so there's that misconception we have that it's just the students. So just putting that. But the other thing I wanted to say was that from the business side where the bid has provided um, posters to put outside their doors about wearing masks and some of the businesses are not putting those posters up, could that be enforced by the town as part of the health? Kind of like what Lynn was alluding to that could we as a town be enforcing businesses to put those mandatory signage outside on the doors, business doors? Dorothy, you have your hand up. Okay, well, building on what Evan said and Chalini, I think maybe we might need to have some new posters made, which would say, welcome, we're glad to have you back, and would have a, a variety of mask students um, maybe with some smiles drawn on their masks. And I think that's the kind of sign that people would want to put on because it's encouraging students to come in, shop, be, be in town. So, I mean, it may be somebody's, maybe the bid has already made them like that, but if not, I think we should seriously consider putting those up. And I do agree, whatever we set up, when the students come back, that's the situation. So I do think we want to make masks required. Um, hopefully it'll be self-enforcing if we do it in a positive way. Kathy? Okay, I just, I, I'm really um, glad that both Mandy and Alyssa spoke out so strongly. I spoke out, I felt weaker, because um, I've also heard about the party boxes that, that Alyssa talked about, that, um, so it's not just two neighbors getting together. So my, my concern, and when you go into these negotiations, is picking out pick out the weak language in the chancellor's letter. For example, um, when it comes to off-campus, Amherst Police and Amherst Inspections will do this work. I mean, they were very careful to say, you know, not UMass students, ambassadors, the kind of thing we're talking about with smiling faces, you know, we're going to work together to have people do it. Um, so that you can have enough people going out with these kind of very positive messages. And the person who called me um, is a cancer survivor with very low Im immune rates. And she's always held welcome parties for students. So she's totally welcoming of students. I mean, she loves them in her neighborhood, but she's just in a panic with 30 in the backyard only some of whom lived in the house with no one with a mask on. So she just, she wants to, you know, this, this sense of um, overflow, particularly if more students are living off campus and we're not monitoring or don't want to monitor how many people are in a house. Um, so I just think um, that notion that it's going to be the Amherst staff as opposed to the UMass 
health staff, the UMass ambassador staff, that this is a team and we need their resources because I don't think police are the right ones, but you know, a nurse coming in or someone with a white coat coming in, you know, just something like, you know, you're part of our community. Um, so it just, it's echoing what other people said, but let's be creative here and really challenge the places where part of this was good, but part of it was very weak and the university ought to be able to do better on helping us with resources. George. There's still some confusion in my mind, and, and it probably shouldn't be, but it's still there, about um, large public gatherings and what the actual rules are at the moment, given the governor's guidelines. Um, what's the limit? Uh, is there a limit? Um, we've been through a summer. We've had a number of what I would consider largest gatherings uh, in various places, more than I think are usual in the summer, um, without masking. And I've been telling people they should uh, call the police or, or make a complaint. Um, so I just need to get a clear sense on what the actual rules are and whether we're encouraging people to do this, discouraging them. And um, if we are encouraging people to do this, um, how would we plan to enforce the rules? So I guess the question is, what are the rules? And uh, then what follows from that? Mm -hmm. You need to unmute. So uh, there's a few things there. So there's what are the rules? Um, and that's probably a little much easier because the rules are the rules. But then what are we going to do is more complicated. Um, we don't have the police chief here with us tonight. So I, I don't want to stray into his area. Um, but so in terms of the rules, so we're in phase three now. So in phase three, as I was mentioning before, um, you can have a lot of people outside. Um, so for example, in a, I want to get my, I don't have it right in front of me, but I want to get my language right here. In a large enclosed outdoor area, there are some metrics. So you're allowed to have X number of people per thousand square feet. I'm going to say like it's eight for a total of a hundred people. So for example, when someone is saying we'd like to have an event at Mill River, which is, you know, it's a park and it's, it's bordered by trees. So it's considered to be an enclosed outdoor area, but it's big enough. So we don't have to, that metric that they have of people per square feet is kind of a weird one. Most folks are kind of like, oh, I don't really want to use that. Um, so we're able to say it's 100 people. Now, the governor didn't ask me how many people, but that's what the governor said. We're in phase three. Um, when it comes to inside, the number was 10 people. Um, it is now 25. But again, um, these are... These are reopening guidelines. Um, what happens on private property, um, what I've heard the police chief saying, and you know, the, the town manager will jump in here, um, is that for, and we're not talking about having the police enforce these things. We do know that um, for various reasons, that's not what we're really looking at. Um, but for example, they can't go onto private property and say, this is what I've heard the chief saying, they can't go at, onto private property and say, you can't do that. Um, so um, I think that if this gets back to, we really want to work, for instance, with the university around um, how, how can there be some partnership? How can they have, so if a complaint comes through, could the university respond? I must say, Kathy, it did not occur to me to send a nurse, <laughs> but, um, you know, could people go out who are connected to the university who are like, hey, you know, this is not what we're expecting of you. This is not in the code of conduct. You are now exposing too many people to the virus and you must, you know, stop doing this and X amount of people have to leave or, or you know, I just, I don't think we have the answer yet to how we're going to address those. And Paul, you know, correct me. But yeah, so like on the police thing, we have no intention of sending police out and the police do not want to have this as a responsibility. Of course, if we say you have to do it, they will, but it's not a responsibility we want the police to have um, in terms of mask enforcement or anything like that. 
um, you know, we, we thought about the ambassador approach, which would make sense if that, you know, just to help businesses downtown with masks and things like that. Um, but, you know, and again, with the parties on East Pleasant Street, for instance, if that's what we're talking about, uh, rather than have a cruiser show up because someone has complained, because we try to respond to the people who are complaining, if there's a university official who showed up, that would be much, we prefer that all the time. Um, the problem we get is when that call comes in at 1230 at night, you know, um, who, there's only one phone number to call. And, you know, and we have the choice of saying, well, that's not in our bailiwick, we're not going to respond, or the police say, we'll send someone to check on it for you. Typically, what happens right now is that the externality of noise emanating beyond the property line is what triggers a visit, and they can give a warning saying, you're making too much noise, you're interfering with your neighbor's sleep, and they can sort of say, you should really should quiet it down. That's usually their typical approach, but it's the thing that emanates beyond the property line. If people are quietly gathered in a yard and they're not socially distanced, they're not wearing a mask, I don't know what authority we have to go on someone's private property to do anything about that. And it may give us discomfort, but I think, you know, and, um, there are, there are limits to the, to what policing can happen in a, in a, in a, or a, you know, a small town government. So, um, so I, I think that that's, you know, I want to be clear that no intention of having police enforce uh, mask rules or anything like that. We don't want to be in enforcing mask rules, but we would rather be on the education end of things. And we hear pretty clearly that I think it's a, you know, we'll take that very seriously about educate and, and put the enforcement in earlier than later so it doesn't feel punitive that we do it earlier. I think that's really good advice. George, you have your hand up. If I may, and just briefly, um, well, I just need to be able, and I know you understand this, to, to explain to my constituents what they should or shouldn't do. And what I'm hearing, and I, that's all I'm concerned about right now, is not the merits or demerits of, of the particular policy, but what I'm hearing is that, look, um, if it's a noise nuisance violation, that kind of thing, then you should call the police. But otherwise, um, there's really nothing that you, I mean, you can call, but you shouldn't. I should advise them not to, um, because the police really have limited, if no, authority to do anything about it. Um, but if it's a noise violation, if it's a nuisance violation, then as in the past, that is something that they can call in and, and uh, complain about. Is that, is that a fair, I mean, it's a pretty crude way of putting it, but I just need to be able to tell people what they should and shouldn't do. I know you know people will continue to call and they continue to call, and I would like to be able to tell them what they should and shouldn't do. Um, whether they follow that advice or not, I don't know, but I'd like to give them good advice. What would you advise me to tell them? So this is where we'd like the university to step up and have those complaints, especially if they're students of the university. Um, and some people, you might not know who they are, right? You don't know if they're automatically young people are defined as university students. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's just a bunch of young people. Um, so we'd really like to be in partnership with the university, with the university taking the lead on this, on those types of calls. Um, they don't show, well, we'll, we'll talk more about this with, with the chancellor tomorrow. Uh, Dorothy. Um, I'd like a definition of private property. Uh, a business is private property, but we have rules for them. Restaurants are private property. Uh, so the university is not public. Pro well, UMass is, but Amherst College isn't. It's private. So are you, when you say private property, do you mean a home and a yard that's that's what I was referencing, yes. Like. Okay. Alyssa? Yeah, thank you. Following up on that, I just wanted some quick clarity. It doesn't have to be tonight, but maybe just, uh, you know, a sentence from the police chief, because we do break up parties of 100 people now. And mm -hmm. so I don't know why we wouldn't do that. I mean, again, I don't want to send police with guns to enforce. I get that. But... The police don't just go because it's noisy. They go because there's a hundred people streaming around. People are assuming there's underage drinking, that there's no keg license. And so the cops go and check it out and then they decide what to do from there. So I'm not sure it's entirely just defined by sound because it can also be defined by just, it's disruptive to have 15 cars parked in front of your house when there aren't normally. So maybe just knowing what that line is, again, so that we manage expectations, like George said. And then the other thing is this 
concept of party registration just seems to fly in the face of what we're trying to do. So like, we're gonna encourage people to continue to register parties, but we actually don't want anybody to have parties. So, but we're saying, but really it's okay to have party, what? So um, it would be worth ch finding out what the plan is associated with that too, because that's referenced and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even though it was a great program. Um, so, under our agenda, this is not in the action items, but in fact, there's been a suggestion that the town council may want to pass a motion in support of the uh, town manager's letter and encourage it. So we have drafted such a motion, but before we can do that, we also have to move to suspend rule 8.4. So I'm asking for a motion to suspend town council rules of procedure, rule 8.4 for the current agenda item. Is there a second? Second, Mandy. Okay, and then I do need to do a roll call. Is there any further discussion on that item? Okay, so I'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Pat, I didn't hear you. Yes. Thank you. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Greasemers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Brian. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Paul Milne. Yes. And Brewer. Yes. Okay. And so it's that has passed. So this is the wording of the motion, the way it presently stands to support and endorse the requests detailed in the Amherst Town Manager's letter dated July 10th, 2020, to Chancellor Subaswan of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, asking for critical changes to the university's plan for students' return for the fall 2020 semester. And given the urgency of matters, we call on the university and Chancellor Sabaswamy to partner with the town to amend its plan for the fall 2020 semester as soon as possible to ensure those plans protect the public health and safety of all residents of Amherst, including all students, whether residing on or off campus. Is there a motion? So moved, Mandy. Okay, and a second? Second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Evan Ross. So uh, when I read the original letter, there were a number of things uh, that were being requested of UMass that I agreed with, a couple that I actually didn't necessarily agree with. I found the Chancellor's letter today uh, actually addressed many of the things that were brought up in that letter. Uh, and of course, we heard now that there's a meeting happening tomorrow and that there seems to be some willingness for the university to work together. Um, given all of that, I don't particularly feel any need or any real impact of this body endorsing that letter. Um, and so I just wanted to put on record that I, I sorry, Alyssa, for the on record, uh, uh, plan on abstaining from this vote. Okay, George. I think I share Evan's sentiment. Um, we're asking them to amend something, but it's not clear what it is we're actually asking them to amend. Um, I have full confidence in Paul. He's heard our concerns. He's going to negotiate as he's done. Um, probably, I, does it hurt? Does it help? I, it just seems like a, a gesture that has nothing really to it. Um, uh, I put my confidence in Paul and his ability to 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 make a strong case. And since I, maybe I misread, I misheard, obviously I'm not looking at a written text, maybe I just misheard it, but I don't see anything very specific in this that says, you know, you must do this, this, and this, and that's what we're asking you to do. It's just saying you've got to do better. Alyssa? 
rather than amending the motion, which already could, took a big lunk of work to put together to show that, and including everything we said Monday night, um, I absolutely believe that Paul will represent us well. I know he would have done that whether we endorsed this letter or not. That's why he didn't have to bring us the letter in the first place because we knew he'd do a great job. But I do think it sends a message, which I also don't like the phrase of, but it does in fact make clear that we have grave concerns. We may not all agree with every one of those concerns, but we do have grave concerns and they need to be shared. And it's not just the town managers representing, it's that the town council is also hearing this and we have expectations of the university. And I think that's entirely fair. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, then we're going to move to the question and we'll start with uh, Darcy Dumont. Could you read it again, Lynn? Yes, to support and endorse the request detailed in the Amherst Town Manager's letter dated July 10th, 2020 to Chancellor Subhaswamy of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, asking for critical change to the university's plan for students return for the fall 2020 semester. And given the urgency of matter, all on the university and Chancellor Subhaswamy to partner with the town to amend its plan for the fall 2020 semester to as soon as possible to ensure those plans protect the public health and safety of all residents of Amherst, including all students, whether residing on or off campus. Good. Good. Excellent. So we're asking them to amend their plan in addition to having just endorsed the town manager's letter. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Grease Mersey, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Abstain. Ryan? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Abstain. Steinberg? Yes. Steinberg, was that a yes? Yes. Thank you. Chalini Balmilne? Yes. Brewer? Yes. And DeAngelis? Yes. Votes 11, 0, 1 abstention, 1 absence. No, there were two, two, abstentions. two abstentions. There were two abstentions. 10 um, with two abstentions and one absent. Who was the other abstention? I'm sorry. Stephen, Evan, Schreiber, and Ross. I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't. I heard the same, and it came after Shane saying yes. Thank you. The vote was 10, 4, no against, two abstentions, and one absent. Thank you for the correction. Okay. We are going to move on to the issue of voting. And, Paul, I'm going to turn this back over to you. So we have a slide deck for this uh, search. And actually it's, uh, this is um, our town clerk, Shavina Martin, who's here tonight to walk you through what she has come up with in terms of uh, options for making our voting safer in the coming in the, in these elections that will be held in September and November. So Shavina. Hello. So tonight I have, I am before the council because um, we have to respond to COVID uh, surrounding our elections. And so um, we are unable to utilize the North Fire Station as one of our polling locations. And so um, Paul and I had assembled the team, Paul has had assembled the team and we looked at many locations and um, came up with a plan to relocate all, all 10 of our voting sites. So on this slide here, um, it outlines our upcoming election dates, which uh, our primary election is September 1st. Um, and then uh, we have our general election on November 3rd. And so looking forward, um, on July 6th, the governor passed a bill 
uh, with legislation surrounding early voting and um, the election season. And so in that legislation, um, we are gonna be having early voting uh, prior to the September 1st primary, and it's gonna be beginning Saturday, August 22nd through Friday, August 28th. August 22nd also will coincide with the deadline for voter registration. Um, and so then for our November 3rd election, um, our early voting has been expanded and it's gonna run also September, uh, excuse me, Saturday, October 17th through Friday, October 30th, and it will coincide. Uh, we will have the deadline for voters to register to vote will be October 24th, or if they wanna make any changes to um, political parties or to um, their address at this time. Moving on to the next slide, it is just informational with where our current polling locations lie. So uh, currently we have our polling locations are located in seven different locations. So they consist of two churches, two elementary schools, the fire station, a library, and then we have three uh, inside of the Banks Community Center. And so um, we have a limited number of buildings that we can use in town for our polling locations. And um, right now we can't use the fire station. So that made me look at all of them. Actually, we were able to get confirmation from um, the two churches. So we were able to, uh, North Zion Church agreed to allow us to hold elections as well as Emmanuel Lutheran. Emmanuel Lutheran has some very strict guidelines if we are to hold elections um, because neither church has been having uh, in-person services. And so um, they've given us very strict guidelines um, and protocols that they have to adhere to. And um, we also, if we go to the next slide, uh, I've outlined here that um, we have some serious concerns with um, holding the elections at the schools. Always, there's always the concern about bringing the public into the elementary school. And also the bangs is currently closed to the uh, public. So that would um, eliminate three of our polling locations. We have three precincts in the bangs. So we have precincts uh, four, five, and 10 are held there. And so um, not being able to utilize that space would greatly uh, affect how we're able to allow in-person voting. While we have um, a major push for uh, vote by mail, the law did not um, change in regards to us being able to offer voting in person. And so that's the reason that I'm before you tonight. And so my recommendation on tonight is that we move these 10 precincts into uh, the Amherst Regional High School. Um, the superintendent has partnered with us. He has been um, cooperating with us and along with uh, the fire chief, our facilities maintenance manager, and the superintendent of public works. And we've all worked together to come up with a plan. Um, we've gone over to the high school um, to map out, you can move on to the next slide, to map out um, traffic patterns, to map out the layout. The two gyms at the high school have adequate spacing um, to accommodate all polling locations. There's um, ample space for social distancing. Uh, we're able to have a single entrance exit traffic pattern. Um, and that traffic pattern also would require no travel through the school building. And there's also plenty of parking, both handicap parking where there are curb cuts and any overflow parking for any additional voters in addition to um, our election. Um, and so the advantages of us moving our precincts to the high school, um, and we can move over to the next slide. And we can go a little further. Is it would, again, it would create uh, the environment where we are able to control uh, 
everyone. We, it's a controlled environment for the in-person in, in voting, excuse me. It eliminates confusion um, for our voters as to where they vote. And the reason I thought of this, um, I was in conversation with Athena about six weeks ago, and she was telling me that uh, in Greenfield, where she lives, everyone votes at the high school. And uh, my coworkers, both Amber and Sue, they live in Belchertown, and everyone votes at their high school. So everyone just knows that there's a one polling location, and that's where everyone goes on election day. And so I thought we could create that same kind of atmosphere here in town. Um, it provides greater and consistent oversight um, by our office. We're able to respond if there's ever uh, any issues um, with the high school being right around the corner from town hall, we can get right over there. Um, it also creates cost savings. Currently, we have to uh, pay a building rental fee for the churches, uh, and so we would be able to eliminate those fees. It would also reduce the number of constables. We currently have um, 10 constables, and we would be able to go down to just one to two police officers there. It would also limit, in this season, it would limit the exposure to COVID, and it would also centralize the possibility for uh, contact tracing if we needed it. And on the long term of it, it would resolve the ongoing concerns that we've received over the years with having um, elections in schools, with student safety, with parking, um, even in the locations where we've had it in the schools. Um, and then in addition to that, this year, our election calendar is in a line with when there's no school. Uh, and so it works out well. And uh, Superintendent Morris has agreed that in the future he would um, allow there to be a professional development day on election day so that that would also eliminate students from being in the building um, at the high school on election day. We can move to the next slide. We have taken some time to consider some concerns and to come up with some possible solutions to some of the concerns, which is the question of if uh, relocating the polling sites will inhibit turnout or voter suppression. And so to address those concerns, um, again, I the marketing strategy is that if we have it in one location, we can get families to go together. Um, again, people know, everyone knows it's going to be at the one location. Um, it's not going to suppress voters. Um, one of the things that um, it would do is, you know, it would be more communal. Um, it, the change of the location may confuse long-time voters, but the way we uh, anticipate or we plan to address that is signage at the current polling location. So all of the other uh, locations, we put up signage just to redirect voters to the high school. Um, and then access to new polling location by public transportation. So when I was um, going through town and looking at the various buildings and even with the high school, I did, I am aware that there, um, there's no close uh, PVTA bus stops. And so one of the things that Paul and I had discussed is the possibility of either offering um, van service to the high school or um, contacting PVTA to see if they would offer a election day shuttle to the high school. So those a uh, few ways that we can address um, the public transportation portion of relocating the precincts. Um, and that we also know that moving polling locations from neighborhoods can cause concerns. Um, and so with that, um, my, in my opinion, I think that moving them from some of the, lo from the neighborhoods, again, will cause uh, a communal effect because neighbors can remind each other like, hey, have you gone over to the high school? Um, and that's just what I'm hearing from people who, again, from my coworkers, that that's just how they, you know, how they do it on election day when they run into their neighbors at the grocery store. It's something that's kind of a conversation piece. And so um, that's how I plan to um, address removing it from the neighborhoods. And then adding distance for travel for people to vote. The furthest distance uh, currently would be for our voters who vote in Precinct 1 at the North Zion Church. So they would have to travel 8.7 miles to get to the high school. Um, and so I do, I am aware that that can uh, seem like it could be uh, a discouragement to voters. But again, if it's something where someone can't make it out to their polls, they can, you can always request to vote by mail. 
Um, and so that way you're, you're still able to cast your vote um, that way without going out in person. And then we can move to the next slide. Um, and I have pledged, because this is just um, where I am, is that my, my job is to ensure that all voters are able to exercise their, their right to vote safely and efficiently. And so I've you know, uh, coined this pledge where I will encourage and I'm going to facilitate vote by mail. Um, and it's my priority to safely, uh, to safely set up a polling location or a method for voters to vote in person and where that is safe. I'm gonna always um, educate our voters about our new polling location. Um, and I also plan on formulating outreach to students and those who aren't regular voters. So we have a lot of people who are inactive voters, people who, um, you know, they're this year and especially, so state and federal years are always popular uh, election years. And so when we have our town elections, that's when we usually see our lower turnout. And so um, I anticipate and plan on creating special outreach to capture those voters who aren't uh, regular voters or only say I only vote in presidential elections. And all of this is to increase voter turnout. Um, that's the goal is to increase the voter turnout. Additionally, this afternoon, I sent the email over to Athena to forward it to everyone on the council. The Secretary of State released uh, the guidelines uh, for polling locations for um, this election season. And so the requirements, um, all of our polling locations normally would have to have um, a minimum of a 36 inch clearance of path for uh, voters to be able to travel through the polling location. And now they're requiring six feet between um, voting booths and between check-in tables and between the travel. And so they're asking us to reevaluate all of our polling locations and make sure that we have the proper signage for social distancing. Um, and, and if that includes that we have to limit the number of election workers. And so it's, it's, um, it was, it's, it's an extensive guideline that they um, rolled out. It came through late this afternoon, closer to 4 p.m. And so that's why I didn't uh, have the opportunity to get it to you before tonight's meeting. But um, so these are the things that we have to uh, take into consideration. And so uh, it is my proposal and, and my, my hope that you all will consider um, voting because the requirement is in order for us to change a polling location, the council has to vote to move, to approve the move. And so that's the next step. I wanted to bring it before you um, and answer any questions or concerns that you may have. Thank you, I, I was muted. Uh, we're going to have some questions, but I also want to just point out is that we do not need to vote tonight, although we certainly need to raise issues and questions. Uh, ultimately, the town council shall determine that the public convenience or public health would be better served. And we have to evaluate and report on whether such change would have a disparaging adverse impact on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. And that, that re report must be published three days before a vote. So- And the, I, sorry, the Secretary of State expounded on that as well. That report does have to, um, has to be submitted to the Secretary of State as well. Okay, thank you. From the, from the council. So, Pat, you have your hand up. Carol, can you, <laughs> sorry, Carol's running a blender. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes um, can. I am concerned I have been uh, uh, working with people who live off of East Hadley Road in South Point and the Boulders uh, working on mobile market and things. And one of the things, they live very close to the malls and therefore the t grocery stores. However, because of a lack of consistent or regular or public transportation, it can take them an hour and a half 
to get from East Hadley Road to the grocery store. So even though the distance is not great, so, and I hear you talking, Siobhan, uh, about shuttles and things like that. Um, I think that aspect of this really needs to be worked out or there's going to be a whole contingent of people who we are trying to get to vote who won't be able to make it or will, it will cause real hardship. So, uh, I think but thank you, and I agree. Thank you for your work. You're so, welcome. I agree. Alyssa? I apologize for the delay. My mouse has decided to stop working, so I'm trying to struggle with the trackpad. I think this is incredibly comprehensive. I think it, it, it addresses so many of the concerns we've had in the past um, associated with voting in schools and then what would that looks like and the fact that these are professional development days, et cetera. Absolutely agree that we need to have a shuttle. And But the important, the, the, the biggest thing that we need to get across to people, and, and I think this report does well, is that people are supposed to vote by mail they're not supposed to go vote in person. This is a different year. They're supposed to go vote by mail. They got their things in the mail to do that, to request their ballots. I know that's not gonna be comfortable for some people. Some people don't like early voting for the same reason, you know, they like being there that day. But we are in a bizarre global emergency. I'm not sure we'd be quite ready to do this if it wasn't for those circumstances. We might not be ready to shift to one polling place. But given the circumstances that we find ourselves under and the fact that we can vote by mail, we don't have to just show up for early voting, I think is incredibly important. Um, I had passed along just some minor questions and checklist type items to the town manager just before this meeting and he and those mm -hmm. will be fine and addressed. And like, I really appreciate, for example, the idea of signage at the old polling place that says, remember, <laughs> we told you to go, the, this might be one of those times we use the reverse 911 call. We use that very yeah. rarely, but to remind people, if you send in your, your ballot by such and such date, or you're gonna need to go to the high school instead. And as it turns out, we have a shuttle for you for that purpose. And I think that it sounds like you have got all those things under control. The only minor quibble I actually had with it was who prepared the report? I literally think you've basically already written the report and I think we need to not make the report into a big hairy deal. I think we need to find a way to just basically have someone sit down and write it and then say, yep, that's these bullet points that are in the slide. These are the exact advantages, disadvantages. This is what we're going to do about the shuttle. The only question I had about that is, and, and I don't see sending that off to committee because we just don't have time, but aside from who will actually put it together is the action of since we just got that email come through tonight is there wasn't really an indication there that they had to approve the plan just that they wanted to see it so do you figure that like they'll just tell us hey that plan stinks but it's not like we have to wait for them to tell us it's okay no, to move forward we don't have to wait for them and the email does, does say that they will do it in in lieu of sending someone out in the past they've had someone from the secretary of state come out and evaluate polling locations and that's not the case. Okay. Um, Kathy. Um, I, I want to second uh, what Pat started with, um, with Vance. You know, we have several neighborhoods, we're just on District 1, um, where people just walk. Uh, they don't take any buses, and it's a short distance from several housing complexes. Um, as so. So if we're if we're going to do this, I think there have to be vans and this how to get the information out. Then I also had a question on the vote by mail. I think absolutely put encourage people. So there are three people in our house, and all, I'm the only one who got the postcard saying vote by mail. At what point should people be worried that they didn't get it? And so there's something wrong with the list, and we we went down and confirmed our addresses um, with the census and other pieces. Um, so I'm just wondering where, where the other two people are. Um. And so I, so yeah. that is the case oftentimes. So on last Wednesday, on the 15th, the Secretary of State sent out all the, to every registered voter in the state, their vote by mail postcard. 
And as with anything, once you pop it into the mail, it's in the hands of the post office. And so you may have just gotten yours first. A lot of residents who have been keeping up with the legislation just called us and asked us if they could get, we already have the 2020 vote by mail application up on our website. You can fill that out too. You don't have to wait until you get the postcard. Okay, that, that answered my question. So same mm -hmm. with if other people. If it just doesn't come, sure. there's some glitch. Yeah. We, can, we can get it. This was nicely printed with my name and my address oh, on right. it. Okay. Right. But yeah, you can always call us. We have on this. I do think for, for people who don't do th this, you know, so some of the people um, are, are, are older, they don't have cars, they are two big complexes, we've got to do, you know, a few vans a day, you know, like shuttling back and forth, because it's not just um, the high school, I was just, just looking like Applewood, it's mm -hmm. 5.4 miles away from Applewood. Now, Applewood can bring people up to vote, um, so they have their own van, but the other places don't. Um, so whatever we do to facilitate in case they forget to send it in. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are our voters. Those are those are our voter, voters, excuse me, that who are encouraged to vote by mail because they are probably most likely at, in our vulnerable population. So right. we want them to vote by mail. Yeah. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I echo the concerns about getting to the high school, especially with no PVTA stop nearby. Um, so I support working with the PVTA to figure out how to do that and vans. Um, I had a couple of questions. The one is, I wasn't sure whether this was going to be a permanent change or just for this year. Um, so if you could clarify whether this is intended to be just for this year because of the COVID stuff and trying to consolidate or whether this would be going forward for indefinite if it works. Um, and then I know at the bank center that has three polling locations, there are three separate lines. Um, there was no indication on this whether we would end up with 10 separate lines, um, no separate lines, one line going in that's social distance. So I'm, I also have concerns about the length of a line if we don't have a lot of people voting by mail. Um, especially if the line is one big long line instead of 10 separate lines. So if you could talk about the plan for that um, and also um, what that might look like if the line does get long, are we, how are we going to provide seating or are we, um, how is the social distancing going to work and um, things like that. And then I was wondering if, I know we have to vote on this by August 3rd, Will we have an idea at that point um, how successful at least this initial round of mail-in balloting application has been? Thank you. Okay, so I will address all of those. So it would be a permanent change. Um, it is something that um, our superintendent is strongly in support of because he has um, fielded many complaints about having um, voting in the schools. He and I spoke briefly last week and he says if this passes, if you all vote to approve it, it would be such a relief for him. And so it would be a permanent change. Um, and as far as lines, so yes, the setup and in the and towards the end of the slides are the pictures inside the of the gym. We sort of we don't have the the uh, layout just yet. I would have that prepared before the third for you. Um, but I took some preliminary pictures when we met and went over to the high school. So as you know, the high school has two gyms. So we would use one door and we'd walk into the first gym. It would be kind of a staging where voters would go and find out where, which precinct, where their precinct is. And so then they'd be, if we go to the next slide. So they come into this, excuse me, I'm sorry, can we go back one? So they'd enter in through the door on the right and then they'd exit through the door on the left. And so the line would in essentially go behind right here where the tree is. And then there's a separate line, uh, the traffic would flow out through the left door. On the bottom slide, should a line form, we would have social distancing to have the line kind of go up the sidewalk there along the side of the building, because it's paved. And it's kind of hard to capture it in a, in a picture, but it's paved along the, um, the school building there. So should we have a long line, 
we would have it socially distanced with six foot markings all the way out. If we move to the next slide, so voters in the top slide would come in through this door here. This is the smaller gym. This is gym one. And this is where we would have someone there. Normally in a multi-precinct um, location when they have it, they usually would have what we call um, wall lists where voters could go up and just look for their street and know where their precinct is. Um, many clerks said that they're gonna do away with the wall list so people aren't touching it. And also so people aren't commingling. Uh, and so we're gonna have someone um, that will, one or two election workers that will kind of be like uh, air traffic control. One of the changes in legislation this year is we'll be able to use poll pads so we won't have paper lists so people won't be flipping through. So it'll be an iPad so we can just look a voter up that way so it'd be electronic. So that would mitigate lines. And then on the bottom slide, voters would enter into the actual polling location through those, um, through those teal colored doors. And if we move to the next slide, um, and this, again, they were having um, the locker clean out day, so it's not set up. <laughs> but as you can see, based on the size of this gym, which is 86 by 92 feet, it has sufficient enough space to hold 10 precincts with social distancing. And so the way that we are going to, Jeremiah had did a preliminary, um, a preliminary site plan where we can have um, an eight foot table so that we can have our election workers six feet apart. And then we put in about four voting booths that are six feet apart. And then we'd have our tabulator and it would just be in a single file line. And so we're going to also have a single entrance and exit point. So voters would walk, all voters would enter into the booths in the same direction and exit from the booth in the same direction so that they could deposit their ballot. And then they would, we have an exit. So if we go to the next slide, they would exit out of this door on the top, which brings them back into gym one, and they come out of the doorway on the left. And we're gonna have that taped off or stanchioned off. Um, if we go to the next slide, they would exit through this door here, which goes into where the weight room is. It seems like a lot of walking, but it isn't. And then in the bottom slide, they come through those doors and it brings them right back out to the sidewalk so that there is no overlap. So that's the preliminary plan. Um, and then the actual setup for the 10 precincts, um, that is something that Jeremiah and I are working on. We can take the slides down at this time. Evan Ross, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, first, thank you, Shavina, for all that work. Um, that okay. explanation just now is incredibly helpful. It showed uh, that a lot of thought has been put into this. Uh, I do share the same concerns about transportation, so I'm glad that's being thought of. Uh, I, I've talked in the past to both Shavina and Paul about uh, my interest in seeing Amherst move to at-large polling locations. Um, and so this is quite what I envisioned, but this is sort of a step in that direction. And I'm hoping that if it goes well, uh, Mehdi asked if this was a permanent change. I'm hoping that if it goes well, we can have a bigger discussion about at-large polling places, um, which I think would do a lot, especially to increase uh, student turnout. Um, the, speaking of student turnout, my question is, I know um, there was an early voting location on campus for the presidential primary. There had been discussions about having one for the November election. Uh, I'm curious if there's still an intent on having an early voting location on campus for the general and also uh, previously the students wouldn't have returned to campus or have, would be just returning when the primary is happening. Now they'll have already been there. Um, so if there was any consideration of an early voting location on campus uh, for the primary as well. So out of, a, out of an abundance of caution, we will not be having early voting on the college campus. Um, we will, we're looking at a few locations in town for early voting for um, August and October, and especially not for October because October early voting is going to be held for 17 days, where normally it's held for 11. Are there any other questions of the council at this time? Let me just follow up with two. So this will have to come to the council by August 3rd, at which point we have to vote to approve. Is that correct, Shavina? That is correct. Okay, and the second thing is, 
we have to have a report filed with you for the purposes of this. And does that have to be done by August 3rd? No, that has to be done three days um, before the change goes into effect. So before the September 1st election. Okay. So um, I want to go back to the council and just say the issues that we have to address are public convenience and public health. And thus far on the public convenience, I've heard issues around having some additional transportation provided, vans, obviously we need to have social distancing, et cetera. Public health, nobody has expressed interest in that and nobody has, and people have expressed concerns about the adverse impact on the basis of race, nationality, disability, income, and age. Um, may, I'd like to hear other counselor comments on this. Mandy Jo? Yeah, um, no, I, I am, I just wanted to check on the date the report needs to be filed because the, the way I read the um, slides was that the report needed to be posted three days before the council votes to change the polling locations, which would mean that the report needs to be posted by July 31st. If we're yeah, going so I'll read the, and, I'll and, read the language well, of the law. Three days, if that doesn't include the weekends, it might mean that it needs posted. If we vote on a Monday, it might need posted no later than the Tuesday beforehand, which would be July 28th. So I, I just don't want us messing this up if, if we're going to do that. Um, and that's in a week and a day. So I think we need to just figure out who's writing that report. I can read the language from the change in the law, if that helps. Yes. Okay. And so it reads, in making a decision to change a polling place, the select board, board of selectmen, town council, or city council shall evaluate and report on whether such change would have a disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age, and not later than three days prior to changing a polling place shall make publicly available on its website and at the office of the town or city clerk a report on its evaluation. This is, you have to write the report only if you, if you would vote to approve it. So if you all do not approve it, then you don't have to write the report, but if you vote to approve it, then you'd have to write the report and this report would have to be posted three days before the change. The change would go in effect for September 1st. But the the change would be voted in on. Yeah, I, I don't interpret those words the same way I interpret it, but that um, at the point we're voting to change, we have, would have had to post a, because once we vote, it is changed. That's the way I interpret it. That's how I interpret it too. Um, I emailed the secretary, I emailed the, the lead counsel for the secretary of state on today. I haven't heard back, and then this was the report that we received this afternoon, but I can call her um, tomorrow to get the clarification and provide the council. All right, Dorothy? Uh, just a quick thought. Um, I, I'm thinking if I were myself and I'd forgotten to do early voting, I wouldn't want to get into a van but on the other hand, I wouldn't know how to get there. So remember those, little, the, the, I guess it's the, the bid has an open van, um, a trolley. Don't, we rode around on those open trolleys. Wouldn't that be really the best thing to ride to the polling place during COVID-19 as opposed to a closed van? I'm open to all suggestions. Okay. Darcy? Please unmute. I, I, um, it seems to me that this plan is incredibly reasonable and makes so much sense. It's so simple and elegant. And thank you so much, Shavina, for coming up with it. Um, and I, I do, I do agree with the idea about getting more transportation. Um, and the, you know, East Headley Road is in District 5, so, you know, I would obviously like to have transportation for those 
people who live in um, on East off East Headley Road. But I would point out that in District Five we have currently we have Crocker Farm and the Munson Library, and the Munson Library along with other polling locations currently have no means of public transportation to get to them. So I'm, I'm guessing that this will be an improvement for people to be able to get there and have you know, some unified way to get the word out to people about how to get to this one location um, because there is no way to get to Munson Library right now. Um, if you live in Amherst Woods, you, there is no way. So um, anyway, I think it's a great idea, Shavina. Thank you. <laughs> um, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that, Darcy, because, you know, North Zion, for example, when I have to go there, the parking's a nightmare. And no, I don't really walk from my house because I have to walk past Emanuel to get there. So we don't have neighborhood polling places, just like we don't have neighborhood schools. That's the reality. And we don't have transportation to them now. And this is a great opportunity for us to be able to manage that transportation more effectively to one place, from a lot of places, but to one place, rather than all the ride sharing that individual organizations have always done in the past, whether it's UMass Dems or whatever. I appreciate Evan bringing up the early voting on campus. I was part of making that happen the first time. I think it's so important and I just think we can't do it right now. Um, and I think that uh, this is great. I did like your original slide about July 28th. I still think that that is a better way of approaching the plan okay. and having the plan ready, which I, like I said, is pretty much written already. Um, because then the public is also much more aware of it than if we really technically don't have to do it until later. I think we may as well do it now to show the public we thought these things through. We may not have the final answer on the vans or the, the PBTA or the trolley, but we'll at least show the public we've thought of these things. And to add to that, there is a lot of things, um, Paul and I were in conversation on Friday, there are a lot of things that the legislation changed and it would made things more relaxed. But in my opinion, I felt that the public deserves more notice. And so I'm, I would agree if the council decides to write the report early, that I would not be opposed to that. There's a lot of things that I, I just, me and my personal opinion, um, I like to provide more information to the public so that they are well informed, so that they know their options, they know their rights. And so um, I'm not opposed to doing things well in advance. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, um, not to hop on the bus conversation, but there, there is a bus stop right on the edge of the, basically in front of People's Bank. And I think it's probably a quarter mile from People's Bank to to the, the gym. And that bus, it's served by most of the bus routes actually in Amherst, but um, especially the, it comes from East Hadley Road. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the bid open trolley or any of these other things, but it's not like this is a complete PVTA desert compared to Wildwood, which is in, which is in our district, which is a PVTA desert. Okay, so um, I'm hearing a couple things. One is that we uh, will move to vote on August 3rd, that it, we as a council feel it would be best to post our report before that vote and it would have to be posted on the 28th or at the latest, I think on the 20, morning of the 29th, but the 28th would clearly be preferable. And uh, that at this point, the major thing I'm hearing is that we feel that with regard to health, it is fine that there will be proper social distancing, monitoring, et cetera, masks, et cetera. And that with regard to making sure that we are not excluding um, people based on uh, race, national origin, disability, income, or age, that we're looking at any number of transportation options, including the fact that there is a stop that is one fourth mile from the gym itself. Any other key points that people want to make sure I make? Andy, you had your hand up. Yes, um, several people have brought it up, but you never put it into the list of issues, which is um, early voting for students on campus. 
And uh, I think that in addition to the reasons that have been put forward by my colleagues, that we also have for this year, uh, the university plan to try and encourage students who are living on campus to remain on campus. And uh, if we don't provide a voting opportunity on campus, uh, then we're uh, reducing that opportunity. So I would add that to the list of issues that we need to address. So in fact, you, you want to make sure that we do have early voting on campus, although the plan right now is not to have it. I think we should revisit that question. Um, I think two of my colleagues have raised it already, and I'm adding a third uh, voice on it with a slightly different reason. Okay. And then we're also encouraging mail-in ballots. Okay. Is yeah. it sufficient to have this report written as a memo? This does not have to be a 10-page report, does it? No, it does not. Okay. Then I think based on the conversation, I mean, we could refer this to a committee or based on the conversation, I would write a one to two page memo and bring it to the council. Questions? Other thoughts? Some committee that would like to take it on? Okay. We will have a memo in your posted publicly and in your packets by the 28th, and we will vote on um, August 3rd. Shavina, thank you so much for your You're welcome. hard work on putting this plan thank together. Um, and I would like to, before we close on this, I would like to add the Secretary of State is providing PPE for our polling locations for the entire election year. And we, as the town, we're stepping up, Jeremiah and I have been working to add additional. So the state will be supplying um, gloves, masks, and cleaning supplies. We're gonna also do additional cleaning supplies um, and we're also going to have the plexiglass. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I just thought I'd take the opportunity to ask Shavina if um, we need poll workers uh, with this. We always do. And, and when the applications to do that would be in and, and everything like that. And another yes. plug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So our application has been up all year. <laughs> the Secretary of State has also been doing a push for poll workers. Um, and so, yes, because we, uh, we, we sent out correspondence to all of our active um, election workers today, and we've been getting responses back slowly. And so we may have adequate staff for September, but I always anticipate we're going to need an additional staff by November. In addition to, we'll need staff for early voting. And so I want to address early voting at the campus. So early voting in and of itself is a whole election day. So it's us bringing a whole polling location every day. So we have to set up, break it down, and bring it back and forth. And I don't foresee the campus wanting us to bring, that's us bringing bodies. So we have to, we have to bring vendors to come and set up. So we have to bring booths. We have to bring a voting booth. We have to bring all the supplies. We have to take it down and then bring it back each day. So we'd have to do that for the whole nine days in August, and then we'd have to do it for 17 days in October. And so that's why there's such a great push for vote by mail, especially for students, because students are subject to staying on campus if they're on campus. And if they're staying home, if they're doing remote learning, they can still cast their vote from home. So that's why the Secretary of State is mailing out the postcards to every voter to capture every voter so that every voter has knows that they have options. And so they passed in-person early voting just for anyone who may be apprehensive for going out to the polls on September 1st or November 3rd, and then, and then a measure to alleviate the possibility of lines on those two dates. Okay, anything else? All right, then I'm going to suggest that we take a quick five minute break and we come back at that time. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody can still hear me and we can hear you. So, Shalini? Yes. Thank you. Alyssa? 
Present. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Yes. Grace Mersey, yes. Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Okay. So we're going to move on to the budget for FY21. And we're going to start with the Finance Committee report. And then the Council will have their discussion. There will be a period of public comment. I'll be asking to see hands before we decide how long. And then we'll move back to motions and vote. So Andy, as Chair of Finance, please proceed. Well, I'm going to not uh, be very long because the report was provided in writing. And I hope that all of uh, my fellow counselors have had an opportunity to see it. Uh, I uh, apologize that it took until Friday afternoon, but we were under quite a bit of pressure to produce a report in 20 days, which the charter allows 30 days for. I think that the uh, key point is that uh, we used um, the provisions that we had already agreed to as a council in the um, guidelines and the amended guidelines to provide guidance to us on standards to apply. <clears throat> we spent um, considerable time in a very short period meeting with the heads of every department uh, and uh, um, asked them questions and uh, really got to an understanding of what was already a rich amount of information that was available. We realized after the public hearing that there was um, a lot of concern about the uh, police department funding question and a request that had been put forward. Um, there were three meetings that were really concentrated not entirely, but fairly heavily on the question of the police department funding issues. Um, I, uh, we tried to explain the reasoning that we um, applied in making the recommendation to go forward with full funding uh, with one additional piece that was very important to us that you've all seen, which is in an additional motion that we suggested that was achieved through the um, second and third of the three days that we talked about it. In the first day, we tried to identify the number of positions that are vacant within the police department and um, then talked about what that meant. And on the final day, realizing that what the um, Council had already been talking about was to have a process that would allow us to uh, work with the community to delve into the issues um, that were raised and to look at the questions of policing that uh, we um, used the opportunity to ask the town manager if uh, two of the uh, anticipated vacant positions in the police department budget could not be filled for a period of time so that money would become available um, through that uh, temp uh, vacancy. We don't know uh, the length of the vacancy because, uh, but we know that it would be for at least a specific period of time and um, that there would be an understanding that we would be able to provide uh, a, or get a report from the town manager to the, um, this, to the actions that had been taken um, by a date specific. So that was um, what um, we agreed was a motion that we would suggest for the council to consider for taking action on the budget as a whole. Um, the other thing that um, I just wanted to touch on is that uh, 
we do need to recognize that any funding uh, that is not uh, that would not be voted does not become available for other purposes because uh, no money is if a money is removed from a budget then you don't raise that money by taxation and the money therefore is not raised and available and then if later in the year additional funds would want to be used that it could only be used by going to reserves uh, the way that it works is that uh, once a budget is passed uh, then the uh, commonwealth department of revenue certifies the amount of taxation that can be raised to in order to meet the budget requirements and um, if you don't include money in the budget then it is not available to be raised uh, and uh, i think that basically touches the high points and at this point i really want to just get questions from my fellow counselors Thanks, Andy. Kathy Shane. Uh, thank you, Andy. Andy summarized um, very eloquently uh, where we ended up. Um, I was, uh, there was substantial discussion and we actually started out with cutting two positions in the budget um, in the police department. And then it was explained that if we cut them, we lost the money. So this not filling them, having learned that there are vacancies and there's no one in the pipeline to come into these that's already in training. And we, we see this, um, and this was part of the discussion, there's a very good page that a lot of the public comments drew on, on page 52 of the budget, of the types of calls that police are now responding to. And there's a mix that could potentially be handled by people other than the police, when we're talking about mental health, social, some social services, but we don't know exactly how that mix might be. And it was pointed out that the one thing we, the police now are, is they are round the clock service. So if someone calls in the middle of the night, there is someone there to respond. So I think we need time to figure out what the alternatives are. And the, the motion, the contingency that's put on the approval of the budget is that by the end of January, the town manager would come back to us and talk about what to do with those two positions, um, having had a lengthy discussion and having had time, we've heard several communities beyond the one in Eugene, Oregon are um, thinking of, what does it mean to, to be policing? What is the kind of a modern, uh, a, a different kind of potential mix? There are other places that are thinking about this and we need time to assess them and think about them. So I thought it was a, um, it's a potential pathway to thinking about um, where we wanna go as well as assessing the kinds of concerns that were raised to us about profiling, about the different neighborhoods being treated differently. So I think we really need time to digest that. So I just want to say it was a it was a, an, a lengthy discussion on this um, coming up with this um, not fill two positions um, and the vacancies. Um, and the other thing about what's happening over the coming year is there will be at least one more vacancy as as they currently know, and there may be some retirements um, as well. So there's, we're, this is the beginning of opportunities to be able to think about this while preserving, as Andy said, while preserving the money. So the money is still sitting there in the town manager's budget. So I just wanted to give a little bit more um, to the background of this, uh, not fill two positions and, um, until we get a report back by the end of January. Okay. Matt DeAngelis, you have your hand up. Yes, I was um, part of the compromise um, to basically freeze these two positions and give ourselves six months. But I've been sitting for the last few days uh, uh, in conversation with a lot of people. Uh, and I feel strongly that this is a time not to freeze them, but to eliminate them. I say that because 
we are in a process or have the opportunity to begin the process in a relatively painless way to really look at what pu public safety is, what we mean, what we envision as a community that safety is. And I realize uh, it's very possible over the course of six months or this next year that we completely restructure how we are um, uh, meeting crisis, how, how police are operating. My hope is that they be go around unarmed. That would be dramatic. But I feel like not taking this small symbol symbolic action of not funding, even if it impacts our tax base, not funding these positions, I think is, is a really important thing. Dorothy? Okay. Um, I think that it's, uh, we've been told that there are several resident committees uh, who have already been meeting and working on ideas about the police. And it was presented to us that if we, the council, made big changes now, we would be in fact short circuiting that process and um, that, would, that would not be a good idea. Um, we do acknowledge, many of us, that it's definitely time to rethink how policing is done and that this move that we've made to do a temporary freeze on these positions while we're waiting for those committees to report uh, and seek and think about study how we could do some restructuring in terms of delivering uh, services through mental health and public health professionals uh, instead of police but working and coordinating with police as appropriate so i feel strongly about that and i, I also wanted to say that um, demands are necessary to change and expand the terms of debate, but in a democracy, that's not the whole thing. You just don't go in and say, this is my demand and you have to do it, but it's a way, it's a place to start talking. And I think that we've got some processes going and we've been talking about more being done in terms of civilian, we well, don't, don't want to use the word civilian, I'll say resident um, overview of how we do deliver these services in the town of, of uh, Amherst. Um, so, because of recent events, this is a great opportunity, so I, I do agree with Pat on this. It's a great opportunity for us to really look at, to look at policing, which has changed greatly over the last, um, well, certainly in my adult years, so let's say 20, 30 years. It has greatly changed, and we've seen what happens when people want to reduce the use of guns we then find the uses of physical force that are unacceptable which luckily are not allowed in our uh, police department but we also have the um, tasers didn't exist when i was young they're supposedly an okay weapon but they kill some people and i think that we would not none of us would want to be tasered so we have to kind of think about how we go about it and be glad that we live in a town which is so peaceful okay but when it comes down to the, after we get this done and hopefully be able to hire more people in public health, we have so few um, people serving those needs in Amherst. We need a, a budget shifting, a restructuring. We do have to remember that in these difficult times, when you, when you want a first responder for certain emergencies and problems, the 24 seven Amherst Police Department is somebody, is a group, we need them, we need them. So. I just want to say that we need this, the police department, but that we should not be afraid to look at, examine, and change how service is delivered and to incorporate more use of, of non-police, but public health and social workers as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. George Ryan. I don't know if, if you can answer this, but I'm wondering what the, uh, if the proposed freeze is put in place, what would be the force level of the police department? My understanding is they're budgeted at 48 officers. I think one of those positions are currently unfilled. Would this reduce the force to 45? Would it reduce to 46 or does anyone know? I'm gonna to have to call on Paul for that question. It would reduce the force, um, obviously two positions down, which I think brings it to 46. Correct. That, that's my understanding, Paul, but I didn't want to do this for a minute. Um, Darcy Dumont. Yeah, um, 
I, I agree with um, the coalition who has come to comment to us in principle. Um, I have really been very moved uh, not only by the, the uptick in the Black Lives Matter movement, but by the testimonies of the many folks who presented comments to us in testimony. And I'm, I'm excited that this issue has drawn out youth and people of color interested in how we govern in this town. And I actually hope that some of the people who have come out are interested in running for town council in a year. But anyway, I've always heard that um, state reps will listen and act if they hear from five constituents. So, so now we've heard um, from 45 people at least, at which um, one of the constituents pointed out is about one tenth of a percent of our population here in Amherst. So anyway, I agree with Dorothy that we do need our police department, but I, I agree that we do need radical change in our budgeting and um, to transfer funding so that it could be used in a program like Cahoots. Mm -hmm. um, and I would support Pat's suggestion of defunding rather than freezing the two APD positions. I'd, I'd actually even support a 10% shift as was done in Northampton uh, and would be interested to hear if there's any support for anything like that. Um, I think we need <clears throat> a citizens committee to make recommendations on how to shift the funding um, or whether to adopt something like cahoots. And um, I um, recommend also that none of the $80,000 set aside for racial equity work be used to fund um, the APD. still there? Ooh, did you lose? Oh, no, no, you're here. You're here. Lynn, you're muted. Lynn is listed as being there. Oh, wait. I'm here. Shalini. I must have muted. I'm sorry. Shalini, it's your turn. Yeah, I just, um, again, echoing a lot of what we're hearing is I want to acknowledge um, so many different people, different backgrounds who've shared their comments and it's been really moving and inspiring. And, and I feel like we're really in a position well at, in terms of our community that's impassioned. They're very passionate and compassionate and they want change. And we're in a place in time where uh, we have a community that wants change. We have a police department that's been showing up Despite the difficult conversations we've been having, they are showing their willingness to be there and work with all of us. We have a town manager, we have a town council who is clearly very passionate and listening. So I really feel we're in a place where we can make really good, thoughtful changes. But rather than jumping to a solution, which is a band-aid, which seems like this is what we need to do, I really do believe we need to look and study this as a systemic problem, not just in policing, but the disparities that exist in our community with respect to education and health and housing. And so mm -hmm. I would like us as a council to commit to creating a community with residents, with diverse skills and backgrounds and maybe use human-centered design where we are looking at at the issues from the perspective of the lived experiences of the people that we're hearing from which we never hear from so this is like amazing we're in a very critical time period where we can listen where we can create a com committee find out what are those sources of um problems and then fix those rather than 
have blanket solutions because there are systemic problems and then there are problems related to specific police people like the, the police uh, who man who murdered George Floyd. And that's a different issue from the systemic things that exist. And we can't clump all the problems together and have a blanket solution. So I really urge us as a council to commit to taking out time and figuring out when are we gonna have a discussion about, I know this is a finance budget issue, but just because we are not cutting, it doesn't mean this is the end of the conversation. I don't believe pushing the budget forward by a month is gonna get us a solution, which is why I'm willing to support the budget as is for now with the freeze. I don't want to eliminate those positions because then we cannot get that money from the taxes. So I feel we need to stay open to that and do a thorough study research and then figure out what the solutions are. But I really want everyone to know that we are listening and we are acting. We are not letting this go. That's all. Alyssa. Thank you so much, um, Shalini in particular. It's great to be able to follow that. I also want real change. And I think that some of the things we're talking about are symbolic to do and don't actually create real change. Cutting them from the budget doesn't create real change. Appointing a committee doesn't create real change. Doing what Northampton does is not something Alyssa ever wants Amherst to do. Period, end of story. They made a bizarre 10% cut based on nothing that now they're struggling to figure out what does that even mean to their reality. I, of course, the items listed in the recent Gazette article of all the things we depend on the police to do, as we've been talking about at length already, I go down that list and I think, don't need a gun, don't need a gun, don't need a gun, but they're the only people we have ready to do those things right now. We do need to make a huge shift. There's no question that the way we do things in this country, and we can start with this community to do it differently, but we can't do it differently in six months. We cannot, in fact, redo the entire police department, even in time for next year's budget. That's the reality, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be working right now to make all of these things happen. It's not painless to, re to remove the items from the budget just as a symbolic thing. I don't think that's gonna work. But at the same time, I'm not sitting on this until January. I'm not waiting for January for the report. I'm expecting that we're gonna hear at every town council meeting where we're at. And we're gonna hear that from staff from whatever staff Paul wants to send to us. And we're gonna keep hearing it from the community and we're gonna hear it from whatever organizations that have already organically arisen to work on this, to tell us, look, you said you were gonna do X by X date. Where are we in August? Where are we in September? We can't say, well, this will wait till after the election. We're at a horrible time with the pandemic, with staff trying to work remotely, trying to work in person. It's such a challenging time, but we can't let things wait. And so I want everyone who hears us talking about January to understand that we're not talking about not doing anything until January. We're talking about doing a ton of things so that we're prepared in January to say, okay, those two positions we froze, do they even need to be police positions? Do they need to be public health positions? What kind of positions do they need to be? And we'll know that at least for those two positions, perhaps, by January, but only because we've done a ton of work in the meantime. We don't have any details by our professional staff on what cuts would look like on the ground. We don't need committees right now. What I mean by that is we don't need official town committees. I know Northampton's going through this elaborate process and driving themselves crazy. How will we find the right people to be on the committees? It's gonna take weeks. How transparent will it be? We don't need any of that. We've got organically arisen committees that can continue to work with the staff that they're working with right now. And when they say to us, you know what? We could use some of that 80,000 for, we want facilitation of this kind of discussion somewhere in the community and we want to be able to pay you know the stipend pay for child care that sort of thing or we want to use a portion of it for this i want to hear that from them i don't want to sit around and say well let's try and define the perfect committee of those folks i think those folks are already here and they're already talking to us and we've got great support already from our town manager from our chief of police and from other staff who are like let's do it let's talk about this let's try and figure it out so I want us to go ahead and make sure there's never been any indication that we were going to spend that 80000 by giving it to the police or giving it to HR. 
I do want to hear from the organically arisen groups who tell us what we should do with that money. And I want to hear back from staff every town council meeting how far along we are in this process. Because if it turns out that, say, September, October, it's like, well, you know, we've been really busy and we have good intentions, but we didn't actually have any meetings, then I'm going to say, you know what, you're done. Like, you're not taking this seriously. But I think people will take it seriously, and I think we will continue to bring focus to it. And we will actually be able to make real change, not just say, oh, we appointed a committee, oh, we made a cut, and then say, oh, look, we did our jobs. We have a lot more to do than that. Evan. I always hate going after Alyssa. Because um, I agree with everything she just said. I, I just wanted to first thank Andy for the finance committee report. Um, I, I was uh, unfortunately unable to attend the finance committee meetings last week. Um, first read about the recommendation in the Gazette and was very confused about what happened. Um, and his report provided a really, really clear explanation um, and rationale behind the recommendation, um, which was especially valuable for me as someone who, even though we're already a, a year and a half into this job, is still very much a novice when it comes to municipal finance. Um, I'm finding uh, myself frustrated uh, now with the constraints that are placed on us by state law and also by the charter. Um, because my first reaction was as the council, why don't we just move those two FTE positions somewhere else? Um, and then someone reminded me that as the council, we don't have the authority to do that. We can't reallocate funds. We can't transfer funds. Um, we can't increase funds. We can only uh, di uh, reduce or eliminate budget items. And that, that really limits what we can do here because I think in a perfect world, I would be here speaking in favor of transferring the money that would be spent on those two FTE somewhere else. And so we can start to put into place a vision um, of community response that relies less on police for response to mental health, to homelessness, uh, to neighbor disputes, noise violations, um, but we don't have the ability to do that. Uh, and so my, my concern with simply cutting the budget now, my concern with simply re eliminating those two FTE positions is that, as others have said, is that we lose that money that could, once, once it is appropriated, could be transferred or reallocated. And so um, I, I intend to support the recommendation with the expectation that that, and, and perhaps it's a false one, but with the expectation that that money will have never actually be used to hire the two FTE police officers, but that it will be available in the budget so that down the road we can see it reallocated somewhere else to better response. But if we just eliminate those positions or cut, it's not like I, I keep hearing defund the police, and when I'm asked what that means, I hear reduce the police budget and reallocate those funds to uh, places that serve the community. Uh, but if we were to cut the budget, we'd only be doing that first half. We wouldn't actually be freeing up money to spend elsewhere, and that's actually very frustrating to me. Um, but we have to work within the system uh, that we have. And so I've been sitting in, I spoke to, to a couple people about this today with a lot of discomfort over what our options are. Um, and a lot of discomfort with a vote that has the optics of us doing nothing, of just appropriating the money as uh, originally planned. Um, but I think what I, we need to make clear is one, we're under a lot of constraints by state law and by our charter about what we as the council can actually do that if we just cut the budget, we lose the money that could be, and I hope will be reallocated and transferred to other purposes. Um, and that all of these discussions will go somewhere productive. And one of the first places I hope we see this, um, as I know that GOL is working on town manager goals for the next year. And this is something that I expect will be worked into them. That this should be a priority goal of the town manager um, to work on how we can reimagine policing in Amherst to be responsive to all of the public comments we've, we've received. And I echo uh, Darcy's comments that I've been so thrilled to see um, public comments from uh, a more diverse, uh, racially, generationally, uh, socioeconomically group of people than we get on, on most issues and certainly than we've ever seen uh, on the budget. 
Um, I'm very happy this year our, our budget uh, hearings were dominated by people talking about racial justice uh, as opposed to uh, what they were dominated by last year, which was sort of the opposite. Um, and so I, I, I support the recommendation with a lot of discomfort, but knowing that or feeling as though it's the best course forward, given what we all want to do as a council. George, you have your hand up. I actually think there is some wisdom in the state law that keeps the 13 of us from just uh, sort of deciding what we want to do with the budget. Um, so I, I don't share quite uh, Evan's view on that. Um, I also hope that whatever conversations take place, whatever these organically arisen bodies may or may not be, that we hear from the men and women who have served this town and continue to serve this town every day. In other words, we hear from the police department and their experiences because they work directly every day with uh, these communities of need. And I hope their voices will be given, will be listened to, and their experiences will be um, listened to and respected. And also, I think we need to hear from the social agencies and the service providers with whom our police department works with, again, on a daily basis and have been doing for many years. We need to hear from them as well. Um, simply a group of concerned citizens, no matter how passionate and no matter how uh, idealistically driven, uh, we also need to hear from the people who actually do this every single day. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo a lot of what's been said. Um, we heard a lot about many issues over policing um, in certain areas of town from the residents um, and residents who feel intimidated and harassed when officers drive by in their cars. Um, we've also heard from residents how the police help the neighborhoods um, address issues of noise in large gatherings. And I don't think we can forget what we've heard from the police um, that many of the calls they receive are for non-criminal issues, mental health, medical, um, but we've also heard from the chief that our department doesn't participate in military surplus programs, um, that they don't go to large gatherings wearing riot gear um, because they have found that that type of response is not helpful to de-escalating situations and that we do not own tasers. Um, I think one thing that hasn't been acknowledged in all of this discussion is the good our police department has done in responding to the community sentiment in the past, particularly with regard to student gatherings. There was an issue in a Blarney blowout seven, eight years ago that got out of hand um, that was not what this community wanted to see our police department responding to and how they were responding. And they changed, they listened, and nothing like that has happened again in terms of how our police department has responded. And I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, but I think we also need to acknowledge what we've been hearing from the black and brown residents and the ex what they're experiencing and that it needs addressed. Um, but I'm concerned that any cut to the budget wouldn't actually address those issues. Cutting a budget, especially by the 52% asked, without a plan in place, doesn't get us where we wanna be, which is to have a community safety plan that has non-police responding to non-police matters because we can't reallocate that money. Because if we cut that money now, there is no money to reallocate without going to reserves. Um, and if we cut that money now, the 52%, I'm not talking about the two positions, we don't have enough officers to respond to crime. We don't have anyone to respond to mental health calls. We don't have anyone to respond to medical calls if our EMTs are busy. We've heard that the police respond to some of that. We don't have anyone to respond to noise complaints on a regular basis. Um, without a plan, a cut is just a cut. Um, I think we need a plan. We need to go forward with the plan. We need to find a plan. So we have to, whether it's a committee, whether it's the ones that have come together and formed and are doing the talking, we need to figure out the alternatives, come up with a plan, figure out how to implement that plan, fund that plan, 
uh, that might actually incur more money than we can cut from a police budget potentially um, and figure out how to do that. That takes time. But between now and the time it takes to do that, I do not believe cutting the police budget is the way to go because it would leave us without anyone to respond to some of these issues that we know we might not want police responding to now, but they're not doing an awful job. They're doing a good job from what we've heard responding to mental health complaints. It might not be what we want as a community in the future, but I think we need to support it now. Um, so for that reason, for the flexibility, I, I'm going to vote for the budget as is. We need the flexibility to be able to reallocate that money. We need people responding to mental health calls now. We need people responding to noise complaints. And right now, the police are all we have. We need to work on figuring out who can do it in the future. But until then, we need to fund the people that are doing it. Steve Schreiber, you've not spoken yet. I'm going to call on you. Yeah, so when I ran for office, I um, one of my mantras was that I am not the expert in any of this. I'm not the expert in policing, libraries, schools, but I'm willing to listen to the experts. And we're in a situation right now, and I know there's a national crisis that is amplifying what's happening at a local level. But I'm, this, quite frankly, is... Um, I don't have enough information yet about really what the issues are. Uh, I think that the testimony that we've heard from the public is, you know, uh, riveting and important, but we really haven't, we haven't had the debate and discussion where I'm prepared to make major changes to the budget right now. I completely agree that those discussions need to happen, that they're, they're urgent. Um, for, so, but one thing for me, the issue is scaling. So if we had exactly one police officer, the assumption that that police officer would have a gun, but that police officer would respond to everything from a cat in a tree to you know, a bank robbery to, they basically respond to everything. So as you scale up your public safety, I totally agree that some part of that public, those public safety officers should not have guns. And I don't know if the Amherst Police Public Safety Department has gotten to that scale where we can have so my wife and I have talked about the fact that in a town that we used to live in, a city that we used to live in, they had the noise police. So noise police, that's all they did. They literally would go around with a book of tickets and write noise summons for noise complaints. They had the water police. The water police would do the same thing. So Amherst isn't, I don't know if it's Amherst is at a scale of where we are that specialized that we can have you know, those sorts of divisions. I'm very willing to listen to that conversation. I think that we probably possibly are at that breaking point where there are fewer public safety officers within the police department that don't, you know, that are, that are unarmed as previous counselors have talked about. I'm totally, um, I think that this is an extraordinarily important conversation to have. I'm not positive what the best way to force the conversation to happen in a relatively short period of time, but I'm, I'm prepared to vote with the Finance Committee on, basically vote with the Finance Committee recommendation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use my opportunity as a counselor to make a few comments. First of all, um, I actually sat at the end of my driveway today waiting for you to come to visit and I'm sorry that you didn't because I had hoped that I would also be able to listen to you and also um, talk with you about maybe how to get this kind of thing done. And that's what makes this very difficult because it makes it sound so bureaucratic, but it, it's, what government, it's how government works. And so I have a vision. The vision is that Amherst has a very, very decent place to start from. That decent place, in fact, includes people with a voice, many of whom we've heard both for and against cutting the police department. People who have a vision of what that money should be used for. That there's really no consensus about that vision. 
the most strongest consensus is something to deal with mental health. We have a budget process. The budget process begins now for next year. That budget process includes sometime in December, January, the council establishing guidelines for next year's budget. And that budget will then reflect the changes that we want to see. And as so many counselors have pointed out, those changes will hopefully reflect the conversation of these various groups of people who have been talking about this issue and will reflect the issues we've heard. But the problem is, and this is where people have been saying this, if we take money out of the budget now, we will not get that back. In addition to we will not get that back is we will not get back the tax base that it builds on every year. And so the way to achieve change in this case is to keep the budget. I'm all in favor of freezing the two positions. If there was a way to do more, fine, but I want to freeze them too and have the conversations and come forward in such a way that we can begin to make changes as we move through next year and as we move through the end of this year and as we move into next year's budget. And that is going to require a conversation that's honest, thoughtful, respectful among all people in this town. And that is my vision. Dorothy? I, I agree with what Lynn has said. I do support the budget with the freeze of the two positions. But I also want to say I really like the sound of what Mandy Jo said, the community safety plan uh, that has non-police staff responding to non-police problems. And what we're going to be looking at is what the correct balance is, all right? And we're going to be talking to the experts. Now, I just want to point out there are two kinds of experts. There are those who are experts in how you deliver those services and experts in what it feels like to receive those services. And the, many of the people who have responded to us are experts in what it feels like to either be over-policed or to feel that they're being over-policed. Police cars go by my house all the time, but I live on a main road, so I always assume they're on their way from one place to another. But if I lived in a off of a, in a cul-de-sac and I found police cars creeping around a lot, it would make me feel weird. It really would. So I do understand what people are saying. And I understand the idea of preventive policing, but we have to always remember to look at things from two sides, points of view. One is from the efficiency of the service deliverer and the other is from the person who is receiving that service. So I think we have work to do and I think that we're willing to do it. Um, and we will come out with, I hope, a better balanced community safety plan that will work for all the people of Amherst. And I look forward to helping work on it. Okay. Everyone has spoken once. Uh, Pat, you would like to speak again. Yes, thank you. Um, this has been uh, an incredible wrestle for me. Um, I am going to take a dramatic leap of faith and believe in this council uh, that we are making a real commitment to doing, um, to changing uh, the way we live in this community. And, and so I will support the budget as written. And I will hold us, our feet to the fire, because we need that. Jelani? Um, yeah, I am, like I said, in favor of accepting the budget as proposed by the Finance Committee, but I would also like us to commit to our next steps in terms of uh, having the conversation about what is our intention as the Town Council, because I'm not completely clear if all of us are on, this, on the same page, whether we're just talking about policing issues or are we really looking at racism in our town and the disparities that BIPOC communities encounter with respect to health, education, um, housing, business opportunities, youth empowerment. And there are all these, so, I mean, where are we as a town as it pertains to all of these issues? 
Secondly, um, who's going to be doing um, the work on studying these issues? It, are the town councilors going to be involved or just the staff and residents or is it residents and all of us? And so that's something we need to agree on. And when are we having these conversations? So while we accept the budget today, can we also agree upon fixing a time and place for when, not place, but time when we're gonna have the, this conversation? I would suggest that we put aside some time on the 3rd of, of August to begin that conversation, okay? And so my job to put it on the agenda, I will do so. Okay, that's our next meeting. Okay. Uh, we have some public comment. I'd like to call on, uh, let me just state, um, residents are welcome to express uh, their views for up to three minutes at the discretion of the president of the council uh, based on the number of people who wish to speak. Right now, I only see two, and so three minutes seems fine. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment or a matter raised during general public comment. Uh, Curry, Peltz, could you please state your name and where you live? Hi, um, I'm Curry Kautz. Um, I live in District 2. Um, I feel like you guys know the spiel. Um, so I've been listening. I have made lots of notes, some in my head and some not in my head. Um, right now, I'm like a little bit confused because at one point that Lynn was speaking, it almost sounded like she part of her speech was um, something you wrote. Um, which is like, it's fine to cite us, but um, that was kind of weird because since it was published, anyway, it was weird. Um, I have a little thing written and I will get to it. Um, I did want to talk about um, <laughs> the real fear of um, COVID-19 and mostly um, the bad choices that UMass has made. Um, and I'm going to say that as a student there who um, doesn't really, not as, probably as big of a fan of Swami as you all are, um, thinking, yeah, anyway, it's irresponsible um, that they have put you in this position where you think you need police. Um, yeah. Um, <sighs> Sorry, I am still not exactly, I wrote a few more notes that I wanted to talk about. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I wanted to note when we did come visit some of you and sorry that we couldn't honestly visit all of you because I think if we had had more conversations, um, I think it would have been a lot nicer. Um, hopefully we can have more conversations in the future and I did really appreciate you guys um, like taking this somewhat seriously. Um, I don't know if you, if it was much of a choice, but um, I don't know. I think there were some of you who were more strongly for it and others who weren't. Um, but I think you guys have actually really tried to make this more of a democracy, um, which I don't see in a lot of governments. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, I am a new, I am a student of Amherst. Um, so I also do a lot of um, organizing around um, UMPD and their stuff. And that in itself is also trying to raise a lot of um, knowledge about because we, d like the way that Amherst is run does not help the students and it doesn't help the town. Um, this is UMass, um, yeah. And so we have done a lot of work as organizing has, you see, um, organizing can do a lot and that is happening. Um, maybe even Ross knows about it. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I said your name wrong. Um, anyway, uh, I, when we said, if you, I just want to remind you, we said, if you vote, yes. Um, damn, I kind of wish I could call in like Gio or Lydia. Uh, anyway, um, at one point we said, like, if you vote no, um, we will support you. Um, and I just really want you to know that 
that is serious. Um, and uh, maybe if you can pull off a no in a way that we that you are actually highlighting us. Um, and there are a few people um, who I would like to note: um, Pat, uh, Dorothy, and Kathy. Um, I think all spoke wonderfully, and I thank you. Um, I was the one who actually spoke to Pat, so that was kind of exciting to feel like you knew a little bit of um, abolitionist stuff. And I think um, I do agree with getting rid of weapons. Um, I would like all weapons gone, um, but I would also like police gone at some point. So that is what I am doing a lot of my work on. Um, but yeah, I think those are most of my notes on the presentation. Um, there are quite a few more things that are not as nice, but um, I think I'm gonna work on that a little bit better because nice things I can give out like without thinking about, but the things that are crit critical, I want you to actually understand. So I'm gonna work on that a little bit more, but you will probably see it at some point. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lydia Irons, please state your name and where you live. Hello, I'm Lydia Irons. I live in Amherst. I'm in District 4. I just want to start off my public comment with a James Baldwin quote. And that quote is, you always told me it takes time. It takes my father's time, it takes my mother's time, it takes my uncle's time, my brother's time, and my sister's time. How much time do you want for progress? And I want you all to sit with that quote. I want you to sit in the discomfort that I hope it is causing you. Because what you are saying about pushing the budget through is you are asking for more time that the people in this community do not have. We do not want it. We do not want to be spending more time in these discussions. The us versus them attitude with the students will escalate because of the COVID crisis and calling the cops feels like the only option in this town for many of the white and wealthy residents. But you have other options. You could fund active bystander training. Then people can feel empowered to speak directly to the students. And as was quoted by the chief of police, students who live in, quote, nuisance houses, the way that the Amherst Police Department speaks about the students is alarming at best and disgusting at worst. I also want to speak on behalf of all of my fellow residents who have showed up at these meetings time and time again, despite having to put their children to bed, despite having worked long days in food service, that don't talk down to us about how the budget works or about how our town government works. We've done our research, we've put in our time for free, and we have showed up every single time. Now I wanna to talk to a couple of you town councilors directly. Evan, you expressed discomfort with not being able to reallocate money. Paul Bockelman has that power. He can reallocate that money in our town budget. And guess what? He doesn't even live in our town. That I find extremely disturbing. Pat, thank you. Thank you for voting to not fill those positions and to freeze those positions permanently. We showed up at your house today and I am feeling really grateful that you stepped up tonight and spoke about how we can start to move towards a better Amherst. You spoke towards a dramatic leap of faith in voting for this budget. I hope your dramatic leap of faith pays off. Dorothy, thank you for trying to empathize with the experience of the people who spoke out in all of these meetings, but this is not a both sides situation. One side has power, one side does not. And I really want you to think about that as you move forward in your position of power. Darcy, you said you were glad so many people of color were interested in our town. I find that insulting. This entire process has been insanely difficult to crack and participate in. And it took so much mobilizing and so much bravery. <sighs> Shalini, thank you uh, for talking about continuing these discussions. But I want to point out that you said taking money away is a bandage. It's not a bandage. It's the first step in confronting the problem of systematic racism. Thank you for wanting to commit to these next steps, but how much talking do you want to do before you make a real move? You heard where we were as a, at a, as a town. Were you not on those calls? Mandy Joe? they did not have 
riot gear on, but they had it in their cars, ready to go. The way they speak about the students should disgust you. They have an obvious warrior mentality around our students, and that's disturbing. You kept saying, without a plan, a cut is just a cut. Make the cut, then make the plan. Lydia, Alyssa, I'm the only one. I think I should have some time. I Alyssa, said, yeah. you said that the money doesn't change anything. I wonder if you've ever been poor. Taking money from police is not symbolism. It's an actionable step. What, these, what are these organi organically organized committees you speak of? Are they me? Are they being paid? I also want to talk to George real quick. You're not here to represent the police. You're here to represent the citizens. You sent an email to one of your constituents that said, are some neighborhoods in Amherst being policed differently than others? Are you currently believe that that's so? I'm not sure. For starters, I would want you to find out from the APD and from finding out, given that there are only usually four or five officers on duty at any given time, it doesn't seem like they're patrolling anybody's neighborhood, end quote. Were you not listening to all of the people who bravely stated their names, their addresses to the police? Wrap up or I will have your mic cut off. <laughs> I don't care if you cut my mic. You heard what I had to say. Thank you. Bailey, please state your full name and where you live. Hi, uh, my name is Bailey Batty. Uh, I live in District 4. Um, I want to be clear, I'm like was not planning to talk today. I threw these comments together really quickly and I, I don't know why I feel the need to say this, but like I am speaking solely on behalf of myself and not on behalf of Defund 413. Um, this is all just, I don't know, an immediate reaction from my brain. Um, I want to make clear that when I said in my first comment to defund the police and reinvest that money in the community, in education, um, in other ways to dismantle systemic racism, the focus was on defunding. I felt like it was important to have like a concrete suggestion of where that money should go because frankly, as has been said several times in this meeting, there's a perception that we're like coming from this without having done our research and that we're not giving you a plan, that we're not giving you concrete suggestions that we're just saying defund. So that was coming from the expectation that you would think we were uninformed. Um, so beyond that, the defunding is the important part. Um, saving that money and being able to reallocate it would be great, but I really think it's more important to be preserving the safety of our community members. Um, and, and if we lose that money, I think it's worth it to, to be keeping people safe, to be not giving it to an institution that is targeting and hurting our community members. Um, so presenting this not filling the current vacant positions as like a concession, um, it's not really a compromise. It's my understanding that these positions are vacant, they haven't been filled, so you're not decreasing the number of police on the streets out policing people. Um, it's purely a budget move. And I know this is a, a budget discussion, but this is, this is not gonna change the policing in any way. This is not gonna decrease the number of cop cars driving by people's houses. Um, and again, sort of about the plan idea, what we're proposing right now, I think there were some, some adjectives used to sort of imply that what we're proposing is like crazy and, and unthought out and radical. Um, we're really not asking for anything that radical. I think there are a lot of radical ideas that we do have, but we have not started by throwing them at you. We are asking for some initial steps um, and to the conversation that this is not going to solve everything. It's not going to solve everything. That's correct. These are initial steps. These are small actions that we suggested because we felt they could be taken immediately with this budget. We know this budget is not going to fix everything. It's it, it was never any suggestion that, that the suggestion to defund would do that. It just is the most concrete thing that can happen literally right now. You could do this now um, and make it happen. Anyway, that's the end of my notes. Um, thank you. Thank you. We're going to move back to the council at this time. There's no other public comment. So we are now going to move to the motions and Andy, I'm going to ask you to start the motions if you would, or if you would prefer, I will do those. I can start the motion. Uh, and uh, the first motion that the Finance Committee is offering is as follows. That the approval of the FY21 
2021 operating budget is made with the explicit understanding with the town manager that two upcoming anticipated vacant positions in the police department's budget not be filled until the town manager in consultation with the town council and residents of Amherst has fully explored alternative options of providing services and presented the results to the town council no later than January 31, 2021. Is there a second? Dorothy, second, Angelus. Oh, Pat DeAngelis is uh, concerned. I couldn't, I couldn't unmute quick enough, but. Thanks. But. Is there any other discussion at this time? Then I'm going to move to the vote and I'm beginning with, uh, yes, myself. And the answer is yes. Anarchy. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Chalini Balmil. Yes. Uh, Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. And Darcy Dumont. Darcy Dumont. Sorry, yes. That vote passes 12 with no, no opposition no abstentions and one person absent. Next motion, Andy. Next motion is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY2104 B in order appropriating the town of Amherst FY 2021 operating budget as recommended by the finance committee and shown on pages seven and eight of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2021 Budget and Additional Orders. Is there a second? Second. I believe that was Dorothy? Yes, it was. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, begin with Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Callie Balmilm. Yes. Uh, Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Reese Mersey, yes. The votes 12, 0, 0, and 1 absent. Next one, Andy. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to uh, a second so I can get my sheet up. The next one is regarding um, the capital projects for the um, uh, enterprise funds for the water and sooner enterprise funds. I believe that there's um, at least one member of the staff present from that department if there are additional questions, but the motion is as follows. To adopt an appro appropriation and transfer order 21-09, an order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund capital projects bond authorization as required by, as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page nine of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2021 Budget and Additional Orders. Is there a second? Second it. I'm and sorry, I do want to note that this would require a two thirds vote because it is bonding authorization. Who is the second? 
It was Dorothy. Dorothy. It was Dorothy. Okay. This does require a two thirds vote. It's a bonding and it is all for either sewer or water. Um, is there, are there any questions? Kathy? Um, it's not a question, it's just a comment um, for people who are listening and for also for counselors. When we voted on the coming years, uh, rate increases for water and sewer, we were given a five year budget that showed this, these capital and the impact of it. So we in effect have seen um, and, and discussed this, which is one of the reason, um, one of the reasons we can come forward with the appropriations now. And anyone who wants to see uh, what those spendings are and when they will hit the budget can look back at when we were discussing the rate increases for the coming year. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, then I'm going to call the question and we move to Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Shalini Bongum. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa Brewer. Alyssa, can you hear us? Doesn't look like she hears us. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'll come back for her. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy Dumont? Yes. And Griesmers, yes. Haneke is? Yes. Okay, Alyssa, are you able to connect? She's just trying to reconnect because she just disappeared from the list. I'm going to give her a moment to reconnect. I'm trying. We hear you. It literally just crashed. Like normally it says something, but it went boom. So yes is the answer. Okay, thank you. The vote is 12 zero zero and one absent and the last financial one andy you want to make the motion and we'll get a second and then explain it okay um i move to adopt appropriation and transfer order fy twenty one eleven, an order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for fiscal year 2021 as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page 10 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2021 Budget and Additional Orders. Is there a second? Second, Andy. Andy Joe seconded that. Uh, Andy, can you give us just a brief explanation of this one? Um, yes, um, this is a standard order in the sense that town meeting every year voted on a similar motion as a, an article at the town meeting. There are provisions in state law for providing tax relief for um, certain people um, because they are either veterans or spouses of veterans, elders, or people with um, severe sight impairments as defined by the statute. And um, towns can provide additional um, tax relief um, on an annual vote basis by each town um, in order to uh, increase the, the benefit for the people who qualify. Um, this has been done every year for a number of years, um, originally by town meeting last year by the council. 
Um, so we're again back with asking for what's really a standard amount. The um, information on the amount is uh, uh, shown in the Finance Committee report. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move to the vote. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy. Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Shalini Bowman? Shalini? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy DeMont? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke? Yes. And Dorothy Pam? Yes. The vote was 12 to 0, zero with one absent. We are done with the budget. And we're going to now, unless the council has other thoughts, try to plow through the rest of the butt of the meeting. Yes? <laughs> Means we don't have to come back tomorrow. I'm seeing no hands, so we're gonna move on. Um, the uh, first agenda item up is Agenda item 8A, it is zoning bylaw 11.250. I want to point out that we'll have discussion about this tonight. We do not vote until the 3rd of August. This is the first reading and it is a bylaw change. So uh, Christine Gray Mullen uh, has joined us. She is presently the chair of the planning board and she's going to make a brief presentation about this. We also do have a slide and it's in your packet. Christine? Hi. Um, hello. Uh, uh, I'll try to keep this very brief. I um, know you all have, okay, great. So we have the uh, proposed change to the bylaw up there. This is um, concerning the site plan review or SPR as it's called. You should have gotten an, a memo from the planning board on uh, the discussions and the votes that were taken, particularly at the joint meeting with the CRC, which I think you also got a report from the CRC. And you've gotten some other documents. I'll speak on the planning board memo uh, report. Uh, uh, both Chris Bestrup and I worked very hard to try to incorporate all of the pros and cons um, and the differing um, opinions on this. Um, for the most part, it's very well supported. Uh, we voted five to two in support of this. Uh, a proposed amendment did come up to add uh, the minimum of four, um, and that also um, was a five to two, but saying that they did not want that added on. So it stands the way it is. Um, I'm excited uh, that this is the first non-temporary bylaw to be coming um, from us uh, to you all, and I hope it's the first of many. Um, I don't know, I hope a few of you or all of you maybe even uh, watched any of the joint meeting as it was the first one on Amherst Media. So that would help you um, get a lot of the dialogue and what was discussed. Um, the SPR, just as a reminder, is a site plan review. And the key is that it is a review. And a lot of people say, well, why are you even considering this? Because they're always approved. And in a way, that is what an SPR is. They are always approved because it's a process where the planning board really gets into the design details and tries to foresee and understand what might be negative impacts of this project. And then through discussions with the developer or contractor owner or what have you, there's a push and pull back and forth to try to better the project as best as it reasonably can for things like traffic, parking, signs, um, anything that uh, might impact or have a negative impact on the community or the neighborhood. And um, these are very rigorous for buildings when these applications come to us. It, 
that never happens in one night. It's two, three, four, five, uh, you know, it's been up to like seven meetings where this is discussed and then there's finally a vote. So it isn't like it just comes to a meeting once and people vote. And we really do um, try to schedule it on a meeting where there's as many members as possible because usually um, with buildings, there's also a special permit that's um, also involved with it. And special permits are still quite rigorous and um, harder to um, get approved as they are a super majority and that requires five minimum of five of the seven members voting in approval. So um, with that, uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight on this and just to remember that it's, we're trying to, if anything, make a make this a little bit less um, hard for the planning board to always have it scheduled and have members there um, because we do want it to pass. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry. So we, we just, um, it's a tool to make the project better, not to stop it. And that's what you have to remember about this. And just one last thing, I did a table, which I hope you all see of the SP, uh, site plan reviews that came to us last year. There were 15 of them. And if you look at those 15, only two of them were buildings. And both of the buildings were involved with special permit also. And uh, so if you look at the other 13, four of them were modifications of these same buildings that had already been approved that when they make little tweaks and changes they have to come back to us so again there's even there's continued dialogue and rigor to try to make it the best project possible and then if you look at the other things just to remind you it's everything from athletic fields to um, sports fields parking lot uh, redos or um, improvements and it can even go down to something like last year we had um, in a subdivision, somebody's three season porch that was under site plan review. So you only want to make it so rigorous because you can't just think about the buildings. It's also about all the others. So Northampton does this and East Hampton and they're having great success and it never comes down to these tiny little boats that people fear. So um, um, thank you for your time and um, good luck. Thank you, Christine. Um, maybe you have a CRC report. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, this report was included in both tonight's packet and the packet from a couple weeks ago. Um, we, as Christine said, we held a joint hearing on June 17th um, to accept public comment. There was no public comment at that joint hearing. Uh, the hearing lasted approximately two hours and that was a discussion between the planning board and the CRC on this. And as I said, without any actual public comment. Um, after discussion, uh, Christine covered it pretty well in terms of what the discussion was, um, in terms of the members who were in favor of this change. Um, other towns are doing it. Um, it is a site plan review. It is not a special permit. Um, so it is meant to be a little easier to, to get past. Um, and, and their concern was that even adding a not less than four would potentially, um, depending on how many voting members are present at the planning board would make it more difficult than a special permit. Um, and so, and one of the other reasons to approach this was because of the charter change and the reduced in planning board size. Um, those that um, were against the change were concerned about the optics of potentially only having three members vote. Um, in favor of a site plan review instead of four, because um, three members, four members voting three in favor would represent less than a quorum of the full body, even though it would be a majority of the members voting. Uh, that was the main argument against the, the motion as the amendment as it stands. The CRC voted four to one to recommend this amendment as it stands. The CRC also faced a amendment um, made by Councillor Swartz to add the not less than four in. The vote was four to one against adding that in. I will do my best since Councillor Swartz is not here to indicate um, her reasons for voting for the amendment and against this vote. Um, as it says in the CRC report, um, she believed that the body should respect the opinion of the staff, keep consistency in the bylaws, 
and believe that if major concerns with respect to obtaining quorum potentially, if there are those, um, which was one of the reasons put forth for uh, moving this down to um, allowing just a majority of those present, that maybe the process itself is broken um, and that would require potentially other things um, beyond just am amending this particular bylaw. Um, so I think that that covers my report for now. I will be happy to answer any questions about the conversation as it comes up. George Ryan, uh, Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. Thank you, Lynn. GOL met on July 15th um, and voted unanimously 5-0 to declare this uh, amendment to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Uh, Christine um, Restrup, I know you're in the attendee group. Did you want, did you have any comment? Would you please raise your hand if you do? Okay, none. Uh, is there council discussion? I see two hands. Kathy Shane? Uh, yeah, yes, I, I'm going to speak in favor of what I understand was uh, Sarah's attempt to amend this um, and put the not fewer than four. I, I see, a, you know, that is still a majority. It's a simple majority of the seven. Um, so it, it stays with, it doesn't go back to the two thirds wording, which would be a much tougher uh, standard. Um, and I, I think you've got two kinds of wordings in there that's very concerning. So if abstaining voters are not counted in the vote, I mean, we're, we're counting abstains when we vote as a council. So we have to have a majority of everyone here. We don't just throw the two abstaining people away. So you could have all seven people meeting, three yeses, two against, and two abstain, and it passes the way this is set up because we don't count the abstainers at all. So you get a simple majority of the people who are left. And when I raised this concern about abstaining, um, a few weeks ago when this came up, one counselor said, but that's like throwing your vote away. Um, we've had instances of abstainers tonight and it's, it can be not it, it, that you're uncertain and you're not ready to vote for or against it, that you've got some doubts. And I think that should give us pause. So I would, um, when this comes up for a vote, I'm gonna propose an amendment that says not fewer than four, keeping the simple majority wording and striking the language on we don't count abstaining. So I want to count everybody in the room as how I get to the majority. So if there were five people, I would count all five. So that I, I just want to signal. Um, and I, when I was reading um, the background information, and I did, I just want to say I did listen to the entire hearing and I would have made a public comment, but I don't think counselors are allowed to make public comments when other counselors are in the room. So I stayed silent. Okay, uh, the only thing I ask is that you submit to me in advance your written um, proposed change before the meeting next week. I mean, I will. The 3rd of August. I will. Steve Schreiber. I'm yeah, so I would urge my fellow counselors to to vote for this as is. So one of the discussions that came up on the planning board is this idea of an overwhelming majority. So um, we all know what a simple majority is. We all know what a quorum is. So if you have a body of seven, a quorum is four and a majority of the four is three. So really we could also be silent on this, this particular issue and it would default to that. So abstentions do not count, they don't count towards the vote. So if three people abstain, they might as well not be in the room. So that is correct. Whoever told you that, that, would, that is correct. But I urge you to uh, go with, to basically to support the will of the planning board who voted for this five to two. So that's an overwhelming majority of the planning board that supports this. So for me, that's decisive that uh, if, um, there are, that's decisive that they that they think that this will help them do their work more efficiently. It also is said at the discussion of this is that 
if you want to participate, you need to show up. So if all seven show up and all seven vote, then there you, you get to your four, then four votes are required. If six people show up, then your four votes are there. If five, five people show up, then it defaults to three. So really, if it's an important issue, you really hope that your planning board shows up and votes. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Dorothy, Pam, I'm sorry, I skipped over you earlier. Okay, well, I very strongly support Sarah's wording. And um, I think that the idea that three people, which is 42% would decide this is not a good idea. We started out by saying, hey, we mistakenly put it so it was two thirds and we, let, we really don't need two thirds. We just need a bare majority. And then the next thing I know, the bare majority is cut down and cut down so that um, it could be 42% of the people there. So I really, I really don't approve of this at all. Um, I think efficiency is not the only thing to be concerned about when you're talking about the planning board. So um, I think you should just leave well enough alone and keep the words in. I, I don't like the phrase of those participating and voting because that limits it so that what you do is you open yourself up for playing games, political games. And I, you know, they do these all the time in town after town. And I don't really think that we need to um, increase that in, a, in our planning board situation. So I, I urge you to add the words at least uh, four, because that would be 57%, which is just a little bit over the bare majority and meets the, um, the, I read through all the reports and the idea was it should be majority is half plus one. Well, 57% is as close as you're gonna get with a seven member planning board. Darcy DeMont. Yeah, I uh, would agree with Kathy, Sarah, and Dorothy um, that that four should be the minimum number. And um, what really convinced me was that um, Chris Brestrup would urge that that there be a minimum of four. Um, and you know, it's really you know it feels the whole thing feels pretty partisan to me. And I, I think that Chris initially brought it up because of the change in the number of people on the planning board and um, but that she, she was careful to say that she thought that four should be the number, the minimum number. Um, so um, I hope that, that we, we keep that. Okay. We are, again, we're not voting tonight. So Mandy Jo, you have your hand up again. Yeah, um, I just want to bring up a few other things that were mentioned in the hearing about this minimum of four. Um, one thing that was mentioned as to why three might be okay, um, which could be consideration of adding language of not less than three instead of not less than four, was that our, until the charter changed, the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, was actually a three member body. Um, as that three member body, they actually had to vote unanimously, uh, three out of three. But that meant that special permits under the Zoning Board of Appeals were actually being voted in and approved with three votes um, of a body. So three, one of the arguments made and one of the things mentioned was that three is not an actual unusual uh, voting number in this town for um, site plan review. For That was actually special permits because they don't do site plan review. Um, and site plan review is supposed to be a lesser uh, standard. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was the possibility that, you know, we're all thinking about this as seven with people potentially abstaining. But um, one thing that was mentioned in these hearings was that at one point, this council um, had to actually approve the participation of a butters and a butters to a butters that were on the planning board in actual site plan review matters because they were otherwise conflicted out and because of voting requirements in our charter uh, in the bylaws including this one that required two thirds not less than five there were too many a butters and a butters to a butters and some people not and, and not a full planning board that they didn't actually have enough votes and enough people able to participate to get to that the current requirement five um, and so we had to approve people participating despite being a butters 
Um, so some of the planning board members mentioned when you change planning board members, and we have potentially three vacancies coming up, that you can't actually do the Mullins rule, which is go back and listen to all the hearings because you weren't a member of the planning board at the time some of the hearings started. So it's not always a matter of members not being there and missing a meeting. Sometimes it's that they're conflicted out, they might be a butters, or they might not actually be able to participate. And when that brings a seven member board down to say five, suddenly a not less than four uh, is an 80% margin, um, which is, it would require, you know, in some senses, a well over a super majority. Um, and so I just wanted to mention some of those other items that were talked about at the hearing. Uh, Shalini, you've not spoken yet. Yeah, I just, I, I think I wanted to draw attention to the UMass, a lot, not UMass, I'm sorry, to the, hold on, hold on, I'm finding the website. It's the mass.gov and it's the smart growth, smart energy toolkit modules that talks about zoning decisions. And this is coming from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And in that they recommend, they say that approval of site plans is usually a simple majority vote of the leading, of the lead reviewing agency, which is the planning board here. So I just wanna say that we, you know, if you're moving in that direction, this is not a special permitting process that is still in place. This is a site plan review, which all other towns, our neighboring towns are passing with the simple majority. And then we should have, you know, follow the same thing. And yeah, that's all. Thanks. Dorothy, a brief comment. Okay, uh, I'm standing for a simple majority. A simple majority would be at least four. Um, it was a bit, um, it was a bit of sophistry, I think, that Mandy Joe was doing, showing that, because three, when three was unanimous for the ZBA, then that's way stronger than anything that we need to do. So I also believe that if somebody has been unable to attend all of the meetings of her, for a site plan review, if they say they have read all the material, they're allowed to vote. At least that's what I saw at some meetings I attended, okay? So, um, I think it's not that hard to get at least four. I think it's a good idea to do that. A simple majority of 57%, not three, which is 42%. And then the fact that not too many things came up with difficulty of this in the past, we may be having many, many more things coming before the planning board in the future um, when we get through this COVID bump, okay? And I, I think that we want to be able to to exercise due care. Andy, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I guess I have a couple things. Uh, one on the question of due care, I think we have to remember that this is um, about site plan review, not about special permits. But the other thing that I wanted to um, raise that I don't think has really been talked about much, and maybe either Mandy or Steve can respond to this a little bit more fully, but uh, if we have a vacancy on the planning board at the time that it comes up, um, then putting a minimum of four actually alters the requirement because it may make the amounts greater than a majority. And I don't think that that's what we're after doing. All right, I just wanna, Steve, go ahead. I was just wanted to remind people we're not voting tonight. Steve? You know, we can think of all the um, scenarios possible. So actually one of them is the Amherst College Fields, which is a real case that actually had to come to us. So the Amherst College wanted to do horizontal construction, basically resurfacing of their fields. Um, at that time, the planning board had six people because one person had resigned two more were butters. So, and the butters really, I think it's by state law, are supposed to uh, be recused. That's different than an abstention. They're supposed to be recused. So that really only left a planning board of, I'm doing four people. So they, they basically could not 
even here at this particular circumstance because they didn't have enough they didn't have enough people so that's one of the scenarios so so it helps the planning board do its work more efficiently not all site plan reviews are really exciting some site plan reviews are resurfacing the fields there was another site plan review that was resurfacing the tennis courts behind the middle school so um, again uh, for the critical issues you your planning board members will show up you will have six or seven people there voting so the number four will be the number that they have to use to get the majority so really three is the default if through vacancies or through you know something else that they can't muster uh, seven or six voting people that they have to go with five voting people we have one person in who has filed a minority report and i um michael you please come forward state your name where you live and briefly tell us what additional you have to say beyond the minority report uh yes thank you very much can you are you hearing me hearing me because i can't yes. see you. um thank you very much for letting me address you with our concerns during your discussion of the proposed bylaw amendment rather than as a part of the public general comment uh, and I assume you have read our minority report, which is included in your packet for this meeting, and I will not reha rehash those arguments. I, I would hope that you would look at them again in light of many of the things that have been said tonight already, uh, which, uh, which I think our argument contradicts or answers. Uh, but basically, site plan review is often, although not always, concerned with large projects, which promise a significant impact on the community. And when that is the case, we believe that it is best if the town and its residents are in general agreement that the impact of the plan will be beneficial in most respects. A consensus is the best way to get to that point, but a narrow majority would be, pro would be problematic in my view. The planning board, of course, is not a representative body, but anything less than two thirds of its members voting in the affirmative should be a strong signal that the project in question has serious defects and lacks general community support, lacks general community support. I do want to emphasize that the current voting system requirements for site plan review work well. The system is not broken. There is no need to fix it. Site plan approval has been granted in all cases since the planning board was reduced to seven members. There has been no difficulty achieving the quorum. If you are concerned that the planning board may lack a full membership, well, you can easily remedy that by your powers of, appoint of appointment. So I urge that you would vote down this amendment or at least take up the amendment that is being offered uh, as, as a substitute uh, and uh, allow the planning board to continue basically as it has been functioning, which has been efficient. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Alyssa, you have your hand up. So it's late and I was not going to speak until there was the insistence on speaking about the minority report. Of course, it's always ideal to hear from everyone who's been part of a conversation, but there will not be a future written minority report from the planning board on anything because the planning board writes a report. There was obviously miscommunication because of COVID, because of not knowing what agenda it was going to be on. And in fact, it did take the planning board a month to write the report after the hearing. We obviously saw the CRC report well before that. But there is not a thing that is a separate written minority report in the future. But I'm always happy to hear, just as I was at town meeting, from the people who voted in the minority, as was the case here. Um, I just reflect back to you, and I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree on this and that I don't compute the percentages the same way some of my colleagues do. And I'm incredibly offended by the colleague who said that this was a partisan issue. This is not a partisan issue. This is having looked at the totality of the information, looking at what our neighbors are doing, looking at the fact that we do in fact often struggle to fill planning board seats, including right now, then I would say that this is not a problem. This is not a problem to do this. It's a simple majority for something that people have the right to do, but we make the design better by a simple majority of the planning board helping them do that. So I will definitely be voting in the affirmative of the original article at our next meeting. I'm going to have us move on to the next issue. We're a bit 
This is on the agenda on the third to vote on. We've heard various opinions and it is getting late. And uh, we are moving on to the Valley CDC project at 132 Northampton Road. The issue is before us because one counselor in particular wanted to make sure that we actually discuss the local option at the time that it came before us. I don't think we had all the information we need. There is now something in your packet about the local option. And uh, Chris Brestrup is here to answer any additional questions. Are there questions about the local option? Chris, would you like to come in and give us any additional information? Uh, yes. Okay. Don't you, yeah, thank you. How are you? Um, so I just wanted to give you a little information about the local option. It's really up to the ZBA to decide um, whether they want to require a local option or not. And what a local option means is that um, people who either live in town or work for the town or work for a business in the town or have children in the school would be considered to be local residents. And the local option um, is a mechanism by which the Zoning Board of Appeals um, requires that the first round of, um, of tenants who come into a building, up to 70% of them may be, may be considered um, to qualify for the local option. Um, and you know, some cities or, and towns would uh, vote for less than 70%, um, so that's also an option. But um, more often than not, when we have discussed local option with the ZBA, ZBA they've gone for the 70 there is a concern um, when you do this that you may be um, cutting out some minorities who are um, protected by the fair housing laws. And therefore, if you, um, if you have a certain um, demographic in your town whereby you have a certain percentage of people who live there or work there, or have children in the school there, and the pool of people um, who qualifies to be in the local option, 70%, uh, doesn't include that percentage of um, people who would be considered under the rubric of the fair of the fair housing market, fair housing act. Um, then you can uh, take people from the larger pool of people who are applying to be. Um, housed in these units. Uh, so that would include people who don't necessarily live here. Uh, but that's kind of a, a complication that you may not need to think about tonight. Um, so really, it's just an opportunity for the first um, round of people who live in affordable housing in town to be um, local people. And then after that, um, it's open to anyone who applies. So um, I think that's kind of a, a good first pass. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer their questions. Pat DeAngelis. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I'm assuming, um, where, I guess my first question is, where do homeless people fall? Uh, they don't have an address necessarily. And um, how would that they be affected? That's one question. The other thing is, if we're talking about regional solutions to homelessness, uh, don't local preference options defeat the regional need for below market housing. And the other thing that I wanna say is the reason I'm not, I will not support this local option is because I've heard it over and over again in meetings about 132 Northampton Road is that people from outside Amherst will come. They will come. And what we're talking about when we're when we're when those kinds of things are said, and there are many others, um, including I don't want to see people like that walking up my street. Then we are uh, hopefully eliminating the very minorities that we need to support in our community. So I am opposed to this local option because I think it, that because of the people who are 
many of the abutters, et cetera, who are supporting it are supporting it for the very, very, very wrong reasons. Um, so, but I would like answers to the homeless question and the regional solution question. Chris, do you have a response on the regional and the homelessness? Well, I do have a response on the homelessness. It's, um, there are various definitions for homeless and some definitions include people who just don't have a house currently, but are um, living with other people that they know, relatives, et cetera. Um, and it can also include people who may be in fact absolutely homeless, but who have an address at um, the survival center or something like that. So I think they can be um, proven to be local people, even if they are homeless. Um, as far as um, the local option, it defeats the regional need argument. I think that's one side of the coin. We have to prove that there's a, both a local and a regional need in order for this um, application to really go through. That's one of the parts of the public hearing process that's very important that the um, applicant and um, supporters of the project demonstrate to the Zoning Board of Appeals that there is a local and a regional need. And that's because we are already have over 10% of our housing as affordable. And so we have to um, support the necessity of having this, um, this development built in our town, even though we're over 10% by stating what our local and regional need is. So um, you may argue that um, the local option would defeat the regional need, but I think given the fact that it's just um, a first round of um, tenants who have a priority, um, I don't really think that is a problem in the long run. And then in terms of people from outside Amherst who will, who will come, I think there's an aspect of this project that not many people understand. We, we have not yet calculated exactly how many um, people from Amherst might be um, moving into this uh, development, but we do know from talking to the developer that they need to build a development that has at least 28 units in order to, for it to be financially feasible for them to get um, financial backing from the people that they're looking to get money from. They, they really can't build a development that's much smaller or possibly even, even any smaller than this. So um, to the extent that they're able, they'll, they'll fill it with local people if that is what the Zoning Board of Appeals um, wants them to do, but otherwise they'll fill it with people from the region and that's, that's the way affordable housing works. So um, I think I'll stop there. Chris, before you stop, could you just give us a sense of where the Zoning Board of Appeals is on this project at this time? How many? The Zoning Board of Appeals has um, gone beyond the point where they would say, we're not going to listen to this public hearing. We're not interested in this project. There's a point at which I think it's um, within 15 days of the opening of the public hearing, they have to declare that um, Amherst uh, has, um, I forget the exact phrase, but essentially it is that we have a safe harbor and our safe harbor is the fact that we have over 10% of our housing as affordable. And yet the Zoning Board of Appeals um, agreed to go ahead with the public hearing process. That doesn't mean that they're approving this project at this time. It just means that they're willing to hear about it. And um, eventually once they come to a vote, then they'll decide if they want to uh, approve it or not. So I can't really tell, you know, um, I can't, I, I wouldn't say that they're definitely supportive of it, but I would say the indication that they've voted for safe harbor and yet are still interested in uh, going through the public hearing indicates that they have open minds. I'm frankly more interested in how much longer you think the public hearing will remain open. A long time. I think it's going to go for probably at least four more sessions. Um, today we talked to the chair of the ZBA about scheduling those sessions into August and September, so it's gonna be a while. Okay, thank you. Alyssa? 
Thank you for asking that question because that gives us a sense of how quickly we have to decide this. Um, I just want to point out that I agree that it's really frustrating to agree with to agree to support something that people are supporting for the wrong reasons in, in, in our principled view, but that doesn't mean that I can't still support them. The fact that the state does have the adjustment for demographics I think is incredibly important, but I also am not interested great quote, I guess. I'm not interested in meeting the regional need until we check and see what the Amherst need is. And when I say Amherst need, I mean people who are already living here in unsafe conditions, living on a couch, and uh, employed in Amherst. I am interested in meeting that need first, and that's entirely why I support local preference, knowing that the state will require the adjustment to be made if it's not reflective of what's still being called minority residents. The other thing I wanted to just ask Chris while she was here is in this article, this information that we just received today, and so we haven't had a lot of time to process it given everything else that's gone on, is there are the four items listed that you went over, Chris, and you included all four of them. I thought, but so please correct me if I'm wrong, that the following paragraph explained you don't have to give preferences to all four of these, but what you can't do is you can't tighten up any of the four. So for example, if I wanted to drop the one about having children in our schools, and I thought that was really important to me, I could suggest that, but I would not do as they suggest in the um, example, you know, 10 miles or something like that. But there is not in fact a requirement that if you do a local option, it means all four of these, you can actually say it's one, two, three, or four of these, is that correct? I believe that the ZBA can decide which of these four categories it wants to include, yes. but it can choose to include all of them. And we would right. normally recommend that they do include all of them. You as staff. We right. as staff, that's correct, yeah. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Do I, did I? Have? Is that Dorothy. for me? Oh, Dorothy Pam. You have your hand up. Yes. Okay, so this is a question. Uh, if not enough um, people with some kind of local tie apply, or perhaps more seriously, pass the screening test, um, wouldn't the next step then be to cast a wider net? I mean, this says you try at the beginning to include local people who meet certain criteria, have local ties. Um, but because I think, you know, when this was originally quote, sold to our town, it was used, local examples were used, such as workers at UMass, even adjuncts at uh, Amherst College, um, and people who are homeless or underhoused. Now, I know that from talking to somebody else in this business that qualifying, you, that people can put themselves forward, but there are many criteria they have to meet to be able to actually make it through the process. So there's no guarantee that 70% of the people with some kind of local tie would even make it to that point. But if it's, po it's, it's a theoretical limit possible. And this is also the first round, which means um, this is when you first do the move-in of the 28 apartments. After that, I think they will, the sponsoring agency will fill the vacancies as they see fit with the people who have applied. So I see, I see no problem uh, supporting the local option and I don't see that it is um, discriminatory to other people. People from outside the Amherst area will be included into this project, I'm sure. Um, I'm gonna make the decision that we are not gonna vote on this tonight, thus we don't have to vote on the delay and since we have time to get it there. But since we have Chris, uh, I'll take a couple more questions and then we need to move on. Shall may I, may I respond to what Ms. Pam just said? Sure. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that they cast a very wide net originally. And of that net, they make two different pools. And one is the pool of local people who uh -huh. would qualify for one of these local um, criteria. And the other is the larger pool. So it's not that they only go after the 70% initially, they go after okay. everybody initially. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Melanie? Yeah, I want to uh, suggest that we do work regionally uh, with this issue because when we spoke with Chief Livingstone in the last finance committee meeting and he talked about 
how we need to work regionally, even though that was in the context of addictions, mental health care. But we can't be selective that with mental health care, we're going to work with you because we need you, but this we're not. So I think we really do around these issues of um, homelessness, racism, um, addictions, mental health, that we do the better, the more we work together as regionally, the better off all of us are. Kathy? I'm just looking, I, I just had a, a quick comment looking at the four possible criteria. The fourth is children in the school. These are units that can only have one person in them. So I, the only way you could have a child in the school would be you were the parent of a child that the child's not living with you. You know, so I just, you know, it's a, it's an odd concept, but I just want to um, point that out that you, because one of my, one of my concerns has always been is that this is only designed for single people. And if someone has a child, they have to move out. Um, so the fourth criteria is a little bit of an interesting one. Um, so the mom who has the kid can't be in this, get this affordable housing, but maybe this other spouse, and that's just assuming the kid's with the mother. But So wh when this gets considered, maybe going down, Alyssa's uh, pointing out, we don't have to do all four. We might think about what these criteria are. George? I think that um, this will eventually address the regional problem. I think it's pretty clear. But also considering the amount of money that the town has committed to this project, it doesn't seem to me to be at all unreasonable to, at least in the first round, give a preference to uh, local residents. Okay. Pat? Yes, um, I, since we are not voting on this, I need to leave. I have preparation to do for surgery tomorrow. So I just wanted people to know that's why I'm leaving the meeting. Thank you. Good luck, <laughs> Good luck Pat. Thank you. All right, um, we're, this will come back on the agenda on the third and by then people will have more of an opportunity to study the material we've been given and also decide what other criteria, if we're going to put a local option on this, we will want to state. And then also the other thing we want to think about is what percentage, if we in fact are going to do this. Um, having said that, I'd like to go on to the town manager evaluation. Um, let me just briefly use the opportunity to just say, um, we're moving along as planned. And uh, this is uh, Paul's uh, self-evaluation. And Paul, do you have any particular comments you would like to make about it at this time? Um, just to say that, you know, it's a 13 page self-evaluation plus the goals that you had established that should speak for itself. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a long journey in the last five months since the goals were set to where we are today. Um, it's a journey that I've engaged with, with a lot of really talented people. And what I've really come to understand with this process and what I've been with the years, um, with the town, um, that it's the people that you work with and the systems that you have in place. And I think this town has really superb systems in place and really excellent people working. And it's those two things together that has us in such a stable environment right now during a pandemic, both in managing the pandemic and on also managing our budget. And, and that, and I relate that to our, our major goal, which is public health and public safety. And I feel we're in very strong positions for those things. So. Um, we talk a lot and I talk a lot in the, in the self-evaluation, but it really is, um, I always go back to those fundamentals of having really superb systems that have been up, built up over years of leadership by the town and also just really strong people in the position. So, um, I don't think I have anything at this hour. I don't have anything else to add to that. Are there any questions at this time? Shalini? No question, but I cannot not comment on the fact how much I, and I think all of us appreciate your values and 
and your commitment and work that you've done. So I just had to say that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? Not to cut Paul short, but it's now 11 o'clock. <laughs> um, very quickly, we're moving on to appointments. George, uh, Ryan, we, the only appointment we have is a non-voting member of the Finance Committee. Yes, um, you've got the GOL report. Hopefully people had a chance to look at it. I think that a couple of keen-eyed counselors pointed out that there might be some obvious confusion because there are only three SOIs and three CAFs in your packet. And that's because after uh, the interviews and after the vote, um, one of the candidates withdrew. So um, there are only three candidates now at this point but the report actually reflects the discussion and debate um, when there were actually four. And uh, but I apologize, I should have made that clear in the report. So uh, we have three candidates uh, still active. And as you can see from the report during the uh, deliberation, it was actually quite challenging, quite difficult um, because we had four excellent candidates um, that all brought a, a wide variety of skills, background, et cetera. We kind of wish we could choose all four of them, but we couldn't. So um, it took us quite a long time. <clears throat> and the report basically spells out for you how it broke down. It was a three to two vote. Um, so it was not, uh, it was not a, uh, it was a majority, but just barely um, for Bernard Kubiak. Um, and um, the argument in favor of Mr. Kubiak was essentially one of experience. And the uh, report that spells out his rather broad level experience. There were two candidates who brought a lot of experience uh, to the position and he had a slight advantage, it was felt in the, by the majority in terms of his experience with uh, other town governments and in, in town finance in general. Um, and so um, he was favored by three of the members of the committee. Two of the members of the committee um, were looking for uh, new faces, a sort of fresh perspective. They felt that there was sufficient uh, expertise on the committee uh, already and that um, uh, they were looking more for a new face and a new perspective. And so um, they um, voted not against Mr. Kubiak, but they voted rather uh, in preference for that, that perspective. Again, back to the majority view, uh, I think the general feeling was that we're going into extremely difficult and challenging time. And uh, we felt that, and I voted with the majority, uh, we felt that the, uh, Mr. Kubiak brought a great a level of experience and, and in, in dealing with these kinds of issues over the years that would be extremely valuable um, and so that was the way it broke out. So three to two vote um, and with four excellent candidates and no matter what happens uh, tonight uh, or whenever we finally vote um, in my communication to all of these individuals, I, I will be encouraging them to continue to apply. Certainly they'll be considered for any future finance vacancies since we hold CAFs for three years um, and I will alert them to that fact, but um, they were four very impressive individuals. And unfortunately, we had to choose one. And as you can see, the vote was uh, was uh, close. Questions, Darcy? Yeah, I um, I just want to note that um, I'm going to vote against this appointment, not because I think Bernie Kubiak is not qualified, but really as a protest vote because of the fact that there wasn't any transparency around this appointment and this. To me, this is a, like a really good example of why we should not have ditched our community activity form process. And just as I had predicted, if you recall, the process recommended by OCA and adopted by GOL involved not only no notice to the public who the of who the applicants were, but no notice to us, the counselors because the new process doesn't require applicants to file a CAF, which we in the past, which in the past counselors would have received. In addition, um, the, so we didn't get any of the CAFs because those three people had all applied last year or Bernie applied back in 2016. Um, in addition, the SOIs provided by the applicants I felt in no way replicated those received by the school committee, which I think is what we were going for. They were brief and in my, in my, <clears throat> pardon me, in my opinion, 
didn't give the amount of information a CAF could give. Um, and so anyway, I believe our application and interview processes shouldn't be different processes determined by our different committees, but should be uniform in our rules of procedure because they affect us all and they affect all of our constituents. Kathy? Um, I, I, I wanna make a comment and then I also have a question. Um, I listened, I did get the SOIs and I actually found them to have a lot more information than CAFs have had. Um, a lot of people have not been filling out many of the fields in the CAF and I don't get a sense of who they are. But so in this instance, I, th I wish they had been longer, but the interview process itself uh, pulled out a lot of information. Um, you got a really good sense of the people. And I certainly agree with GOL. This was an extremely difficult decision because you had excellent candidates um, and you were just choosing two, two ways of going. So my question is if, if um, you want to vote or if any of us want to vote for the candidate that got two votes as opposed to three, do we have to first vote against the candidate that got the majority and then propose the other? Or how, how, what's the mechanics of that? Um, and I just want to say the reason um, I, I agreed with the uh, reasoning of the two counselors who were for the other person. And it's because um, I think finance is a potential route to someone getting interested enough to run for a council seat. I do think there's a learning curve, but I also personally have found that if you're willing to commit to it, it's not like years and years and years. And I think it's a breath of fresh air when someone hasn't been through it over and over again, because they look at everything with the new eyes. I found that with one of our residents now, non-voting members, he asked questions that haven't occurred to other people. And I think we need to keep doing that. And we, we have a lot of depth on the current finance committee. And if you listen to our meetings, it ends up a few voices tend to dominate for that reason. So I don't think we need to reproduce that. So my question is on the mechanics of this. If you're not, I, I wouldn't be voting against the three to two choice here. I would be wanting to vote for the person who got two votes. And I, I don't quite know how to do that. Uh, this would have to come to a vote. The vote would have to fail and then you would have to make your proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, Evan, comment? Yeah, so a comment and then a question for <laughs> GOL. So as, as a comment, um, as you all know, I worked uh, with uh, Mr. Kubiak, excuse me, on the bylaw review committee. And on that committee found his deep experience uh, in municipal government to be incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, and so when I read GOL's majority opinion, uh, citing that experience for the reason for recommending him, I understood it immediately because I saw firsthand how valuable he is as someone. And my thought was that his value, uh, the, the value of his experience was twofold. One was that we are in a very difficult uh, time economically and budget um, financially, and that we would really, uh, it would be useful to have someone who had that experience. Um, the second thing I thought was that uh, finance committee per the charge resident appointments are two years and that if he was appointed for a two year term, we'd have someone who had a lot, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of experience um, that who, that's uh, term of service would exceed the term of service of our current counselors. And so if we did have a big sea change in the next town council election and lost the expertise on the council, um, we would still have someone on the finance committee who brought um, a lot of experience. But then I was surprised to see that the motion is only recommending his appointment to June 30th, 2021. And so my question is, why is it only a one year appointment when finance committee appointments are two years appointments? And wouldn't it be smarter to do a two year appointment so that we have someone whose term exceeds the council so that we have that continuity of institutional knowledge? 
I believe the motion is wrong. <laughs> that is correct. The motion is wrong. It's a two-year term. It should be 2022. <laughs> well, then I retract my question and say that that is a great idea and he's the perfect person to have go between council terms, given that we can be guaranteed that someone with a whole lot of experience in municipal finance uh, will be continuing on, even if all five current members of the town of the finance committee get booted out in the 2021 elections. Are there any other comments from councilors? Let me just say, while I voted one way in the finance committee, I will be voting for the candidate. I never had any doubt about his qualifications. Um, and that is where we are right now. Alyssa? Oh, I just wanted to say quickly that when it comes to process, that of course the statements of interest were in fact attached to the GOL meeting posting, just as they used to be for, just as the equivalent, because we weren't doing it exactly this way, with the OCA process. So it isn't that the public wasn't informed or that the council wasn't informed. It's true that no one spoon fed us the information, but we'd all been told for weeks that this was this process was going to take place. And so all we did was subscribe to the notice. And sure enough, there are all the statements of interest were. And in terms of the length of the statements of interest, although even in the short ones, we in fact got more information than we used to on the CAFs. Um, of course, the, the process is always up to be adapted in terms of just saying, you need to cover these three topics in your statement of interest. That's not difficult. It's just a decision for the committee to make in the future. Okay, if there are no other comments, I'm going to uh, ask for a motion. George, if you would, please. Okay, Lynn, um, the problem is I don't have a motion sheet in front of me. I have it right here. So I'll oh, just, thank you. I'll make the motion. You can second to thank appoint you. Bernie Kubiak, Bernard Kubiak as a non-voting member of the finance committee per charter section 5.5 effective immediately for a term to expire June 30th, 2022 as recommended by the governance organization and legislation committee. Is there a second? I second that. Thank you, Lynn. Any other comments? Then we will move to a vote. Um, I've lost track. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Shalini Ball Milne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis is now absent. Uh, Darcy Dumont. No. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Abstain. Okay, so we have one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in favor. Two no's, one abstention, and one absent. And it passes. Two, two, okay. two absent, two absent. I'm sorry. Eight in favor. Okay, I'm sorry, two absent. So eight in favor, two against, one abstention, and two two absent. Did I go right that time? Yes. No. Yes, I did. Okay, got it. Um, we are going to move on right now to committee reports. And just if you don't really have anything to add at this point, uh, and that you have a report filed, please indicate so. CRC, Mandy Jo. Um, just that the current report for tonight's meeting that was drafted and submitted for tonight is includes the adopted CRC process for appointments to planning board and ZBA. I encourage you to read that if you're curious what the process was that was appointed. It includes the process and the deliberation around what changes we made and how we got there. Um, Mandy Jo, in the interest of transparency, um, do you, where will you be moving now with the ZBA appointments? Nowhere was ZBA, ZBA is full. Planning I'm sorry. board. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> For I'm planning sorry. board tomorrow, CRC has a meeting. Um, at that meeting, it will be discussing whether the pool is sufficient to move on to adopting selection guidance. Uh, draft selection guidance is in the packet for tomorrow. 
Um, if we determine the pool is sufficient, we will move to discussing that draft and potentially adopting that draft. And then I presume if, if that goes well, we would also discuss when we might do interviews if all of that happens um, and when statement of interest might be due and all. So we are moving forward, but we won't have a decision until tomorrow at the meeting on whether the pool is sufficient. And to Andy Steinberg, who we owe enormous gratitude for persevering in a 20 day period to get us through a budget. So Andy, anything else on the finance committee? No. Thank you. <laughs> um, GOL, George, anything else? Nothing to add, no. Okay, Kathy, JCPC's not met. PSO, Darcy? We're meeting on uh, Thursday evening at 6.30 and talking about our, our review process. Okay. On the area of liaison reports, uh, George, anything particular on the Board of Health? I had a question. I don't want to take up our time now. Um, I have written something up. I'd like to submit it. Maybe I should wait for the next meeting and just submit it then, and that would be that? That would be fine. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, anything on community preservation? No. Okay. Any other liaison reports at this time? Okay. We've already done the minutes. Paul, <laughs> anything you'd like to highlight from the town manager's report? I, I apologize for the late hour. No, it's it's written. We've talked a lot about a lot of things. So if there are questions, I'm here to answer. Are there any questions of the town manager on the town manager's report? I just want to note that he's learning new technology skills. So how he, so he can now link things in his report to things that he would like to find. And he's learned this from his daughter. <laughs> truth, truth be told, Athena did it this time. <laughs> Athena did it this time. And um, we appreciate that, Paul. Thank you very much. Darcy, questions? Yes, um, speaking of IT, I'm just wondering if there's been any progress made on um, making the public visible during our meetings. Um, That's really a question to me, not to Paul. Okay. So I'll address that later. Dorothy? He did mention it in his report, FYI. Uh, right, but it's, it's, I've really had the conversation with the um, staff, at, although Paul, if you want to speak to it, go ahead. I, I, that, the report was referencing all committees, not the council in particular. So it's how, how we're addressing and supporting all the different committees out there. Um, I do note that we've had multiple meetings that have been Zoom bombed that have created crises for people. And that's why we are really careful about this. So I think it's a bigger conversation with the president. Dorothy? Um, I just have a very quick question to Paul. I'm assuming that that's a very bad sunburn. <laughs> I hope yeah. so. Puzzling and puzzling. I, I'm, I'm, I'm following Evan's lead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you feel good. <laughs> Great. George? Well, it looks like uh, the CDBG CARES Act funding is, is presenting a bit of a challenge, or maybe that's not the right, right way to put it, but we didn't get all that we were hoping to get. Um, I know you're looking into that. Is that something you can report back to us at some point as to what the rationale was or, or what, because obviously we're counting on this money, and when we don't get what we expect, that's going to cost us. So yeah, I'm just worried about that, I guess, but I know you're worried about it more than I am. Yeah, so we didn't get everything that we asked for. Uh, we uh, we have a meeting on Wednesday to go over what the reduction and what that means and how we will approach that. Um, and I think you know there were a number, probably about it seemed like ten communities that didn't get everything that they asked for. Um, we were one of the things that they prioritized was regional approaches, and we did not have a regional approach. We focused on our downtown area uh, and other other services as well. So. That's what their explanation was. Dorothy, do you still have your hand up from before? Okay. And George, your hand is okay. Any other questions from the town manager? <coughs> All right, moving on. Uh, town council comments. 
So I probably at probably every two weeks, I have another round of conversations with IT about trying to figure out how we might make our meetings so that people can uh, come into them and be seen and be heard without subjecting us to Zoom bombing. And um, I, at the after the last one, did write up uh, a summary and I realized now I failed to send it to you. Um, and the, that, the bottom line is that it can be done with additional staff sitting here for the entire meeting and being prepared to shut people off. And so then we calculate that across all of our meetings and it would probably mean close to an additional staff person. In addition to that, I've learned that Northampton is actually a thinking of moving in the direction we've moved because of Zoom bombing. And I think this is a much longer discussion than we have time for tonight. It's not for lack of exploring or looking into it or trying, but uh, I do think there are some serious trade-offs and some, th some things we need to consider before we would ever push for anything beyond what we've been able to do. Darcy? Uh, yeah, just on that, it seems like there are situations where um, when a person has provided public comment more than once, and we are we know the person i don't know why we wouldn't be able to make that person visible i know that you know that seems like a strange standard but it did occur to me tonight that we we knew all of our public commenters from past experience and there was really no reason why we couldn't turn their cameras on but anyway that aside um i just uh I didn't have a chance back when the town manager, when we were talking about the town manager evaluation, I couldn't get it together to get my comments ready in time. <laughs> so okay. I just have one thing that I, I was hoping that the town manager could, could give us more information and um, about two big A, little a, which is, um, um, you had said that for staff, you had established um, the importance and priority of the goal, the climate action goals, um, um, and to ensure the goals were included in decision making. And I just wondered if you could give us a little more on that by the next meeting or something so that we just could see what you've been doing. Would that be possible? Thank you. Okay, George, Councillor comments. Yeah, just quickly, I, I I think that it might be helpful. And this is obviously for you to decide along with the rest of, of my colleagues, but to invite um, people like Tony Maroulis and perhaps uh, Bill Laramie and a few other of the individuals that will be responsible for um, the the community over the next uh, few months, <clears throat> particularly from the UMass community, but in general, if they could be present for. Uh, an opportunity for us to talk to them and ask questions and hear a little bit about where they're at. Uh, I don't know if August 3rd is possible, but uh, certainly before um, the students uh, all begin coming back, I would just suggest that as something to consider as an agenda item. I think it's an excellent one. It does raise another question because August, August 17th is set aside strictly for the evaluation of the town manager and students start arriving on the 15th. So we either put it on August 3rd or we have it as a separate meeting, which would have to be August 10th. Yeah, I heard that sigh, Kathy. <laughs> Let me look at the agenda for August 3rd. I know that we jammed, we, take, we threw a lot of things off of this agenda into that one because of this, and we will be talking about that on Wednesday. And George, I totally agree with you. Um, we also will know more after we meet with Chancellor tomorrow and also after Julie meets with the healthcare people. Okay. So we'll look for. Okay. Uh, Dorothy. 
Is it true that we have no meeting tomorrow night? It is true. Okay, great. Thank you. Because you plowed through tonight like the troopers you are. Not sure we had a choice, but. <laughs> are there any other comments that people would like to make at this time? Hearing none, thank you everybody for your patience and endurance. The meeting is adjourned.